Takes on Yoel Romero in his highly anticipated Bellator debut. Live tonight at 10 on Showtime, the home of combat sports. Saitama Super Arena outside Tokyo to the Vegas Strip, but that list is not complete without the Shark Tank, the SAP Center in San Jose. And it was in this building where Phil Davis signing as a marquee free agent back in 2015 after years at the top of the sport made his Bellator debut. And tonight, man, that comes full circle as he welcomes Joel Romero trying to follow in those very same footsteps. Great to see you, Sean Grandy, John McCarthy. Man, it's funny how life works. Because six years ago tomorrow, you and I were in this building for Phil Davis's debut. It was the very first Dynamite. He wins two fights that night. He goes on to win the world title the following year. Everything was just peachy. Went as planned. But the 205 division that Yoel Romero enters tonight is a different animal. You got a Grand Prix going on. You got depth. You got veterans. You got undefeated fighters coming up. We know this is Phil Davis's last chance, probably, to get towards the top of the title chase again for Yoel Romero, John. This may be his only chance. You know, this may be his only chance, but you're looking in Yoel Romero at a guy who, at the age of 44, he very much reminds me and is reminiscent of Randy Couture, who won a title at the age of 43. And I will tell you that Yoel is. Probably stronger, probably faster, all of those things. He is a special athlete. You take a look at the way that he just is looking at this weigh-in right here. He is a monster, and he tells us, man, I feel better than ever. I'm faster, I'm stronger, and I feel good because the one thing he was doing before, Sean, is he was losing so much weight to make that 185 limit. Now he's at 205. That is a 20-pound difference, and you could just tell by his attitude this is the right choice. This is the right place for him to be. It's like looking in the mirror for you, right? Seeing the Yoel you know, Romero up the stage. We look like brothers like in the God, body. It's, no? it's just it's incredible. It's identical. All right. It is moving day. It is moving month at 2.05 with the Grand Prix semifinals coming up next month in Phoenix. So an uh, awful lot going on. Christian Edwards trying to stay undefeated, opening the show on Showtime. Coming up at 10 o'clock Eastern time, you're going to have two former world title challengers, Alejandra Lara and Neiman Gracie, both trying to get back in that picture. But, man, when Georgie Carahania is on the show, don't blink. Oh my God, this matchup between him and Sal Rogers is perfect. We're just talking about weight with Yoel Romero. And now let's talk about these are both guys who were fighting in the featherweight division, now stepping up to the lightweight because they were losing too much weight. They were having too many problems in keeping their energy during the fights. And they said, I can't do this anymore. I need to move up. And both of them are here to say, I want to be the lightweight champion. I'm going to prove that the, this was the right move for me. And I'm going to prove that I'm better than you. You know, we, we all learn so much, right, as we get older. And isn't it funny, after everybody killing themselves cutting weight for years and years, they become older, and they finally go up one weight class, and they all tell us, I've never felt better in my life. And huge success for so many fighters. I hope that weight cutting, as we've seen in the past, is a thing of the past. All right, so your Romero and Phil Davis will end it tonight, but we begin, well, where else to begin? But at the very beginning with a long-awaited, and I do mean long-awaited, professional debut. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the first fighter ready to make his way to the cage, Joshua, the real deal, Dylan. Experience is a relative thing. Joshua Dillon of Fresno has spent less than three minutes in the cage as a pro, but two fights of experience is more than his opponent has tonight, although uh, don't expect his opponent to blink under the brake lights. 
No, his opponent is a guy who has been under the bright lights for a long time, but Joshua Dillon is a guy who's got a lot of skill. He believes in his submission ability, and when you're going to face a guy like Delgado, who's a great wrestler, you're also talking about a guy that can make mistakes by putting his hands in places that those submissions will be much easier to achieve. And we now welcome his opponent, Jesse Delgado. Well, if you follow amateur wrestling, if you follow collegiate wrestling, yes, that's that Jesse Delgado, the three-time All-American, the two-time national champion at the University of Illinois. But his dreams of MMA took a back seat the last few years, and at age 29, it was getting to be now or never, and he chose now. He chose now. When you're talking about a guy that has what it takes to be, a top-level MMA fighter. You're looking at him right here in Jesse Delgado. He's got so much experience, not only in the wrestling world, but putting the pressure on and being in those pressure situations and coming out on top. He's got it all. Let's check out the tail of the tape in this long-awaited pro debut for Jesse Delgado. Well, you just said it right there. Pro debut, one and one. Both are young fighters, but this should be a very interesting contest for this pro debutee in Jesse Delgado. A night that ends in San Jose with the long-awaited Bellator debut of Yoel Romero begins, as always, with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Bellator MMA's return to the SAP Center here in San Jose, California, as we get set now to kick off the prelims tonight here at Bellator 266 with three five-minute rounds and a contract weight of 130 pounds. And now, first introducing the blue corner at five foot seven, weighing in 130 pounds even as a professional. He's one and one. He fights out of Fresno, California, Joshua, the real deal, Dylan. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot six, weighing in 129.5 pounds. Tonight, he makes his professional MMA debut. He fights out of Gilroy, California, Jesse Delgado. In charge of the action, your referee, Mike Beltran. A lot of butterflies in there right now. <laughs> For All right, both. gentlemen, first round. You ready to fight? You ready to fight? Hell, let's go. Talk about the wrestling pedigree. You see a close-up shot of those ears. You probably don't need that described. Well, a lot of people would say this is a throwback fight because in Joshua, you're talking about a guy that likes to stand up and fight. And right here, Jesse just taking the fight to the ground. He's the grappler, but he also is very good on his feet. So he's not a guy that is not accustomed to throwing his hands and being successful. Is that issue number one for an elite level wrestler who by definition has spent so much time on that? What is step number one in making their transition? You know, the step number one is you've got to say, I've got, I cannot think of just being the wrestler. I've got to be a full MMA fighter. I've got to embrace every bit of it. I've got to, I've got to be able to do the stand-up. I've got to be able to defend against the submissions, and I have to be able to apply those submissions on top of the wrestling skill that I possess. In addition to the collegiate accomplishments, a high school legend in Gilroy, you heard the ovation. Obviously, a big cheering section with him for this debut. He's been coaching Daniel Cormier's academy. He's got a ton of kids that are under his tutelage, and you're talking about being able to learn from one of the very best. That's a great opportunity for any young kid. Skills, sportsmanship, how to carry yourself, and it's also my understanding that those kids learn some interesting language <laughs> at DC's place. I'm sure they do. You know, right now you're looking at what Joshua Dillon's doing. He's trying to, you know, create some space here. This is what makes wrestlers so difficult to fight is their base and balance is so strong. You do the right things, you create frames, you try to off-balance them, and all of a sudden they're just right back down heavy on you and landing big shots. 
Nice step over, almost got out, wasn't able to get through that guard, still in full guard. I mean, the first thing you see, anybody can see the high hips of Delgado, how strong he is in the stance. Actually creating a lot of downward pressure onto Joshua. You know, the shots to the body here, that's just to try to open up the guard, get him to move a little bit, just like you're seeing now that's an open guard. He's trying to use those hips, get himself into a position where he can get out. And again, right here, Delgado needs to think. Good job of keeping his hips forward, his chin back. Well, he took a good shot. You saw he was grabbing the fence, which yep. he can't do. We're going to see a couple of pro debuts here coming up, and it's always, it's so fascinating to see everything you've studied. Anyone just taking a big test on the bright lights, you feel like you got it walking in there, and then, wait a minute. Well, this, you, you said it exactly right. This is a big test, and this is a big audition. you got to figure you've got Scott Coker sitting here watching you saying, let's see what this kid's got. You go out and you impress him, guess what he's going to do? He's going to sign you to a contract. This is your audition. You want to go out there and put it all out. Don't leave anything, you know, in the tank. Do everything you can to show him what you can do in that cage. And for Joshua Dillon, it's just, I mean, think about this opportunity for him because there are so many eyes on Jesse Delgado that you wouldn't normally have facing the guy in his pro debut. Exactly, but and you look and a lot of people will say, that, well, man, that's, that's a tough fight for you. It's a pro debut. If you're yeah. going to get this guy, this is the time That's to right. get him. And this is the time for you to impress that president, Scott Coker. Aaron Pico. <laughs> I mean, it happens. It does. Absolutely. You know, and you, these are the things. This sport is, it's called a shoot for a reason. Anybody can win. That's one of the things in Bellator by getting to see so many of the elite guys who are going to become elite fighters, watching them in fights you wouldn't have seen in a previous generation, where they're learning their craft in fight three and four and five of their career. Well, the one thing I'll give Bellator is they do a fantastic job of building young fighters. You know, let's just go to right to the, the number one you could name is featherweight champion now, A.J. McKee. His very first professional fight was in Bellator. He's now, what, 18, 19, and 0, all of them in Bellator, but they built him from the beginning. Heavy shots by Jesse Delgado. Those are the ones that start to break it down. Grab the fence. And Dylan grabbing the fence, not even trying to get up, leaving himself open in these shots. And as far as an opening round for a pro debut, doesn't get much cleaner than that for Jesse Delgado. Chill. Breathe. Just breathe and relax. Right here. Sit back right here. Sit back and relax. Nice work. Good head positioning. We could step over to half guard. Let's step over to half guard. Good half position, good Here. fracture. You need to be more active there. He's comfortable there, right? By the end, he starts to strike more, he starts moving. I need him to worry about that position. Make him work. He's tired of it, okay? Perfect. Okay, find your time. Take down. Get you agree with that? Position. Step over to half guard? Absolutely. He was there. You know, and, you but he, he, this is his first fight, yeah. so to sit there and, you know, I could have said things about, you know, he needs to, you know, push that, step over that. Hey, if we get him against the cage, can't expect open too much right now. There's so much the going on in his head. All right, he's, to get you know, the in this now, now in the second round, so now start breaking things down and tell him exactly where he needs to improve his positioning and where he can do more damage. Is it better in a pro debut if you were the coach? Your coach and just sometimes maybe lay back a little during a round and not yell the things that are Absolutely. popping into your head. Especially when your fighter is actually doing well. Yes. Right. Don't, don't overload wild. him. Move your direction. All right, gentlemen. Did you guys do that with Josh the first Ready time he's on the desk? <laughs> no. You overload him all the time. He'll be coming out a little more aggressive. Leg kick, anything to throw Jesse Delgado off balance. Jesse Delgado's shot got the takedown about 20 seconds into round one. Dylan needs to, you know, that little ring that you see, he's backing himself up towards the, the cage way too much. He's a step forward. See, this is where it is. He, he's waiting for that to happen, and it's gonna happen if you're gonna sit there and wait for it. Long learned the difference between knowing what's gonna happen and being able to stop it. <laughs> this is true. 
Now we'll see if Jesse's able to take what his coaches gave him for information and now actually put it into practice here in the second round. It's so early in the round, plenty of time to do it. One of the things, look at what Jesse's doing, head positioning, look how heavy he is, driving his head into the forehead area, creating a problem just with where Joshua's head is able to be that week. When your head's to the side, you become a weaker fighter. Jim Heffernan, the legendary wrestling coach in Illinois, recruited him, picked him up at the airport. His life changed as he embarked on that career. And Jim Heffernan just retired. And his replacement, Mike Porta, just hired Ed Ruth yes, he to be did. his assistant. That's how small the world it is yeah. at the University of Illinois. You know, and you talk about a guy that, you know, incredible wrestling credentials, unbelievable in being able to get other guys up to a certain level. Ed Ruth is going to be a fantastic assistant coach for him. Work to finish, gentlemen. Let's go. Move your position. The guard is a lot more closed here in round two for Dylan than it was in round one. Which is telling you he's starting to have a little bit more in the, he's getting tired, a little bit weaker, can't frame out the same fashion as he was before. All this pressure is starting to get to him. That was a nice heavy elbow by Jesse. Thanks my start. You're a young fighter in your third pro fight. Try finding a partner to train with who's a two-time national champion. They don't. It's hard to find him on Craigslist. Yes, it is. That is not easy. You can put out all the ads you want. You're not going to find him. Hey, turn him again. Turn his head this way. Smart. You hear the coach tell him, turn his head this way. What he's trying to do is put his head into the cage. There's the opportunity. Yeah, he's where he's trying to stop it. Yep. But again, look at where his left arm is, and if he has to do that right, he can block that leg, put pressure down, step over it, close down on it, and he's going to pass. And by going for the Kimura, Joshua yeah. Dillon has let him pass in this situation. Hail Mary attempt here. We'll Good. see if Jesse's smart enough. He can also free up that right leg and continue all around. It will take all the pressure away from any type of Kimura. Step over a little bit. Stay heavy he's on that stepping side. over. That's what you hear his coach is talking about. He steps over. Now he can just walk around the head. Big Going into a seatbelt position right now just to hold himself right there. You see Joshua trying to just shake him off. He needs to keep doing that. Get him heavy on the weight forward. Really high. Delgado is. Delgado could do a lot of things. He can reach back, go for a Sulawev stretch here off of the leg since it's right there for him. But at this point in his career, I don't think he even knows what that is. What are the odds that he knows what that is? <laughs> Unless you want to yell it out. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Yep. Now we'll see what Delgado does. Wrestlers do not like being on their back. Let's see if he scrambles to get himself back up. This is the problem when you are dealing with a guy who is an outstanding wrestler. It's that ability to scramble out and continue on until you get your reversal, get yourself in the position you want. Right now, a lot of people are going to look at that. They think there's a guillotine. That, that is not going to work from the position that he's in. Explain why. Yep, he's got the wrong angle on the hold, and his legs are not in a position for him to create the power and leverage he needs to make that choke work. Be interesting to see if there's another progression that he has offered in between rounds. Everything's nice. I need you to be more. When you start to use your elbow, that's when he's spinning. That's when he started using his energy, right? And him on that mode. Once we get that takedown, let's go to half guard. Okay, last round. Half guard, yeah. Just, just kind of find your way to half guard. So then we start the end route. Let's get to mount. All right. 
So we get down, let's, let's start passing the knee. Use the can openers really well, but start passing the, the knee to get to half guard. Okay, no. Good, man. Last round, he's gonna come out a little bit wild. He's gonna come out wild, so be ready. Same thing, same thing, Jesse. When, my favorite part of that minute of coaching, when we get the takedown, not even when we get the takedown, here's what happens. Next. Confidence is key. Yeah, yeah. That's more like as reality, as close to confidence. <laughs> Seven Five years since he won a second national ready championship. Fight. You ready to fight? Hell, go. Said now or never at age 29. Let's go. You know the shot's coming. That's all he has. Set it up. All he has is that shot. Go ahead, Jesse. Put him over here. Let's go. He's in the middle, Josh. In the middle. Dylan hit an early leg kick in round two. Does it again in round three. And there it is. Shot. And there's two. That's just timing. He was, he was waiting for that extension by Joshua Dillon to extend forward that punch. Changes levels right into the legs, brings him right down. I think Jesse would be best right now doing his work. Don't drive him towards the cage. Make it to where you can have all that room to pass to either side. You can work to either side. What are you hoping for? If you're Joshua Dillon right now, what mistake are you hoping for from a quote unquote rookie? Well, he's making a mistake right now. When you take a look at where his arms are at, he is that his hands are to the ground. You do not want your hands on the ground. I don't think that Joshua is feeling that or seeing that he can actually open up that guard, start, try to switch his hips, take one of those arms. But right now, Jesse's in such a position as far as he's feeling so heavy on top of Dylan that Dylan's not even think, looking at that submission opportunity. Where do you want his hands? He wants his hands on his opponent. Every time that your hands go to the ground, now they're in a position they can be attacked. When they're on the opponent, it's much more difficult for you to attack that submission. See how his left arm was under the head, now his right arm under the head. It's got to be very careful. You start to get into someone who is really good at their submission game, they're going to start to attack you with that. Again, reaching back to where most of this fight has been, which is up against the fence. Right now, Jesse has all the opportunity in the world to pass that guard, especially going towards his left side. The ability is there, it just doesn't feel it. Nice job by Joshua. Putting the feet on the hip, trying to create that yep. space. Jesse just crushed it down. He hasn't given him nearly as many opportunities to pass, though, in round three. Until now. <laughs> That's a beautiful Until call. Until now. Beautiful call. That's it. Stay happy now. Drive your hand left side. Come on, left side. And one thing that wrestlers are very good with, the position of half guard is their, that's a wrestling position. That's, they can control the body, they can land punches, they can land elbows. Wrestlers love the half guard. But you did hear his corner talk about half guard, and I want you moving towards mouth, so we'll see if he actually follows that instruction. Guards over. Ryan. Who? He's got he's, Mount. Yeah, he's gonna say, Pap, you don't want half guard from there. And Mount was there, now he gives it back. Now right there made a mistake. He had the ability to get his hooks yeah. inside. It was open for him, but went back to his wrestling roots and getting his hips back with heavy pressure. Which in the fog of war, you're gonna go back to what you know. Go back to what you've been trained to do. He's got the ability to create a crucifix here. It's being a little bit difficult for him to get to as far as where the fence is. That's where he'd want to bring his opponent. Again, odds he has spent any time on that. 
a lot of weight on Joshua Dillon right now. He's working actually to get a takedown on this Delgado. Not exactly the thing you would think he would be working hard for. It would have been better for him to get out of the way and possibly get to that back to that stand up. Dillon left his head exposed for a split second. We have his bell run. Stay heavy on top is not advice that Jesse Delgado has needed. Well, again, and, and in this situation, what, what we talk about is high head wins the position, and you can see that Joshua wasn't able to get his head high. And what happens when a two-time national champion makes his MMA debut? He goes to what he knows, and he dominates with it. That was a good, tough, pro debut fight you got three good rounds in you learned a lot from it he's going to go back he's going to see what he did well where he could have done better every round started the same way in the first 20 to 40 seconds for jesse delgado just watch them you know it's the, see that level change right there you saw the drop of the level the drive in nice and low very difficult to stop someone that has that type of entry very very quick very strong in his positioning again right through every time and the numbers will be as lopsided as the 15 minutes were if you check out the fight stats look at those fight stats 59 strikes landed to six but it's those three three to zero all came in the first 30 seconds of each round and all result in jesse delgado having dominant position for the rest of each round you gotta feel pretty good you go through a fight and you basically got hit eight times we'll say yes. that's pretty good pretty close to pitching a shutout it's gotta be a good feeling to be on the other side of it Seven years after winning a national championship, Jesse Delgado's pro debut, and Michael C. Williams will make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Your first, Michael Bell, scores it 30 to 27. Ron McCarthy, 30, 27. And George Allen, 30 to 27. All have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Jesse Delgado. High school legend in Gilroy, two-time national champion, three-time All-American, and now an undefeated professional yeah, MMA yeah, fighter. Yeah, yeah, boy. Let's get a picture. Hey, John, we've uh, we've gone 28 minutes without having to go to the desk. I suppose we have to do it now, don't you think? Yeah, uh, might as well. All right, Jen, it's yours. <laughs> well, thank you. Hey, uh, don't make us feel excited getting here. Come on, guys. All right. Hey, look, we are so excited to be here in sunny San Jose, California. It's the home of the San Jose Sharks. And this guy over here, two-time world champ Josh Thompson. Are you excited to be back in your hometown? No respect from our colleagues down there. What's going on? All they do is jab at us and watch you guys at home all night. That's what they'll be doing. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I know you've had some uh, historic fights here. You've actually fought here 12 times. You see these guys out there? Does it make you miss it a little? Absolutely not. <laughs> I'd rather be up here sharing exchanges this way versus you throwing punches at me. I love this a lot more. I could throw a lot less, um, uh, you know, harder punches that you would normally yes. get hit with. Okay, well, tonight we've got a great lineup of fights both here on the Bellator YouTube prelims as well as on our main card on Showtime. Let's talk our headliner first. We've got the Bellator debut of Yoel Romero. He's taking on our former light heavyweight champ and Phil Davis. What excites you most about this one, Josh? Everything excites me about this fight. It's a lot of the unknown though with Yoel Romero that excites me the most to be honest the talk and the buzz he's going from 185 where he struggled multiple times to make weight and now he's going up to 205 and he's fighting somebody like Phil Davis his wrestling pedigree being the Olympic silver medalist and fighting someone who's an NC2A champ out of Penn State in Phil Davis those type of things the unknown of Yoel Romero is what makes it interesting for them because the wrestling we feel like it may cancel itself out I would give obviously the advantage to Yoel Romero because being an Olympian and a Olympic silver medalist. But 
Phil Davis, if he uses his rust, it's nasty for everyone. And his youth also may be a factor in this fight. Well, you talked about the weight, um, you know, moving up for you. Oh, we talked to him this week. He said, I'm just happy. He said, his, you know, training, it didn't change much. He's just happier walking around at 205 rather than cutting down to 185. Well, we're going to have, it's going to be a great one tonight. That's just one of uh, four fights that we have coming, excuse me, one of five fights that we have coming your way on Showtime at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. It's lots to look forward to, including our next preliminary bout. Who's up next, Sean? All right, well, more more pro debuts for you, but, you know, it's funny. I would never, somebody turn Josh's headset off because I want to say something nice about the fact that he was on the first event here, and you really, again, it's painful to say it, but you really have to appreciate what he gave to the sport. When you're here in San Jose and you look at the research and you look at the years that he put in, it's impossible to not give him his place in this sport. No, oh, look at Josh Thompson was a legend in this building. He had some of the very best fights. He had one of the best fights I've ever seen. His second fight against Gilbert Melendez, a champ. He was the champion. He lost that fight, but it was so good. Such an incredible performance by both guys. He's a legend here, and I hate to say that because I like making fun of him. All right, turn his headset back on. Uh, so we move on, and Again, on a night, we're going to see some pro debuts. Edwin De Los Santos has had an interesting and very successful amateur career. And now set to make his way to the cage, John, superhero Adam. Edwin De Los Santos. The way you said that almost suggested that there had been illegal events going on. Oh, the first legal. Oh, I would never say that. No, I know you wouldn't. <laughs> it was a really a, a seminal, a 2006, the event that Scott Coker, of course, put on here in this building was a game changer and opened a lot of eyes in this state. The idea of it, you know, we just uh, in the last five years have been through New York being the last state to finally make it legal. And the thought in California of all the places in all the world and all the states to not have legal and it took a while for it to happen in California. So oh, it was crazy. You know, I, I was part of the whole, you know, process of them legalizing it. And at times it was like, are they ever going to do this? But they did it. They've done it right. It's been fantastic here in the state. And the Athletic Commission, which is now run by Andy Foster, is just remarkable here. Let's check out the tail of the tape. We don't see a lot of 125ers in Bellator. Very simply put, again, another pro debut against John Adams, who is 0-1-1. But I have watched John Adams fight numerous times. I've seen both of those fights. He is a scrapper, a gamer, a guy that never quits. This should be fun. And we welcome those tonight tuning in live to the prelims on YouTube, the Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports as we continue on now in the flyweight division scheduled for three five-minute rounds introducing the blue corner at five foot seven weighing in 125.4 pounds his professional record early on oh and one with one draw he fights out of San Jose California John superhero And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot five, weighing in 125.3 pounds. As a professional tonight, he's making his debut. He fights out of San Jose, California. Edwin De Los Santos. In charge, your referee Jason Herzog.
First round, buddy, you ready? Buddy, you ready? Fight! I can't imagine how many pro debuts you have refereed. But is there a, a common thread? Can you almost tell when a guy's in there for the first time? Absolutely. You know what? It is the pressure that's put on them in that that moment that, that you look and you go, hey, this is now, it counts. Because all those fights, you can have a lot of amateur fights, and it, you can have a great record, but it doesn't matter. It all goes away. But now, they all count. And these guys, they feel the pressure. And you'll see guys work their way through that pressure. And that's where you go, this guy's he's going to make it. He's going to be good. You talked about seeing John Adams because both of his fights have been under the Bellator banner. When you're seeing a fighter for the first time, what is the very first thing you are looking at or looking for? I'm, the first thing I want to see is I want to see that they are relaxed in what they're doing. They're not tight. They're going to sit there. And they don't go crazy if they get hit. They're not sitting there having to hit their opponent back right away. They just are relaxed and saying, it's OK. They go about doing things at, in their style. Just right now, like what you're seeing out of Edwin De Los Santos, he's a stand-up fighter for the most part. He's got some ground. He's got a you know, blue belt, BJJ, but he likes to fight in the stand-up. That's where he started in the martial arts. And look what he's doing. He's the one controlling the location. It's his pro debut, but he's the one controlling where this fight is at and how it's being fought. So that's saying a lot about his just his, his experience from the amateurs. Edwin's doing it. One thing, if you're watching, watch when Edwin's throwing those kicks. His hands are definitely coming down. And if John Adams sees him do that, he take advantage of that mistake. Reaction the first good shot. John Adams needs to start countering when it, you cannot sit there and be the punching bag. You have got to say, if he's going to try to hit me, when he comes at me, I'm going to make him pay for it. See the bottom of the left leg of John Adams already turning red. Clean right hand by Edwin. Uh, he's not moving as well. A lot to think about here. Now I've got through. Well, as the right hand got through, John Adams did land a nice right hand, did not affect Edwin at all. Exactly what you just talked about. Like, all right, he got one. I'm fine. Punch it and go, Edwin. I need four straight punches. Oh, no, that came in low. You good? All right. Watch your low kicks. Hey, Edwin, let's touch first and follow. I'm working the takedown, Jonathan. Edwin switches stance back and forth, left and right, hey, southpaw to orthodox, just almost at will. So that sometimes will really cause a guy a lot of problems because they can't figure out that angle to attack their opponent with. De Los Santos, 27 years old. This discussion with a couple of people this week, which is how do you know it's time? When is it time to have that first professional fight? Because you see it at 23, you see it at 29, you see it after two amateur fights, you see it after 12 amateur fights. And obviously every case is different, but what is the common thread that says, all right, get out of the nest, let's go? <laughs> you know, the, the, oh, that was a nice body shot. Yeah, he's landed these from the beginning. John Adams in big, big trouble, and it's over. That was as veteran a performance as you're going to see from a fighter in his pro debut. I honestly believe he got hit one time in that fight. He was in control from the very beginning and just very systematic in the way he landed his shots. Nice, nice debut. Take a look at this kick. Watch where it lands, right under the arm and the elbow. That liver kick, that drops John Adams down. That hurts him. He is in trouble at this point. Watch the, right there, that shot, you can tell it hurts him. You can see he can't breathe at that moment. Now it's a matter of does he survive? He doesn't do enough to stop what's going on. Jason Herzog sees enough and ends the fight. That was methodical. He landed a, a leg kick early, a low leg kick that completely changed the way John Adams was moving. Boy, did he ever pick his spots? That was awfully impressive.
Yeah, that's when you know you're a good training partner or a good coach. You take the met, the wet mouthpiece out no matter what. It's okay. <laughs> Walks into his pro debut, walks out 1-0, and and his expression never changed. Take a look at the right side rib cage. Yeah. You can see one shot. Michael C. Williams makes this official. Ladies and gentlemen inside, the Bellator cage referee Jason Herzog steps in, waves off the contest due to strikes official time. Three minutes, 29 seconds into round number one. The winner by TKO, Edwin De Los Santos. You can smile, young man. You can smile now if you want. You earned it. There may not be a men's flyweight division in Bellator yet. Edwin De Los Santos hopes there is one, but the women's division became very quickly must-see, and Jen, for a uh, former world title challenger tonight, trying to get back on that list. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Looking forward to seeing Alejandro Lara and Deanna Bennett throw down. Well, Bellator 266 is underway here at the SAP Center in San Jose. Now, our five-fight main card starts tonight at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific, headlined by the Bellator debut of Yoel, Soldier of God Romero. He's taken on Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis in our main event. And then in the three spot, we've got an exciting matchup, as Sean just said. It's the fifth-ranked Alejandro Lara, Bell and she's taking on Bellator newcomer Deanna Bennett. And for more... On this flyway matchup, let's shoot across the pond to Bellator's London office and our very own Gareth A. Davies. Deanna Bennett meets Alejandra Lara in a women's flyweight fight tonight as the Californian known as Vitamin D gets her dream home fight against the all-action Colombian inside the Stentorian atmosphere inside the Shark Tank. Number five ranked flyweight Lara was unhappy with her performance last time out against Kana Watanabe and has insisted that going into this bout at 27 years old and with 13 fights on her resume, she must take only ownership of her career, that she's no longer a novice and will aim to be fast, elusive and decisive tonight in both attack and indeed defence. For Bennett, coming in off a loss to the formidable Liz Carmouche, it will be about imposing her physicality and drawing the wild brawler out of Lara to smother her foe and live up to her gym reputation as Queen Kong. Take it away, ladies. We cannot wait. That's right, we cannot wait. Now, Josh, we just heard Gareth there say that Ali Helena Lara was not happy with her last performance. She told us this week that she wants to come in more focused, mo more mature. So what does that look like inside the game? Exactly what Gareth said is that Deanna is going to try and pull that brawler out of her. And right now, Alejandra Lara, she needs to be mature and, and not allow that to happen. Look, in her, in the past, she loves to fight and you see it when she fights. She holds nothing back. She's really aggressive sometimes to the point where it actually works against her because of the muscle fatigue. She doesn't give her time, herself time to rest in between transitions. So when she does have a dominant position in exchanges or when she gets to the top and is able to get the back, any of those things, she doesn't know when to rest in those situations. That works against you as a fighter. She said she went back and looked at what she, how she's performed and she's realized that she needs to mature. And by maturing, is making sure that she's not wasting energy in areas that she doesn't need to. She controlled the uh, Vita Ortega a fight from the beginning to the end with long straight punches setting up the head kicks she did a great job but in those exchanges with Watanabe she let her emotions get the better of her she wanted to get her out of there but then what what she does very well is when she does get to that top position she does a great job of getting to the top of the mount and doing the ground and pound if she can do that and slow the pace down and control those i think she'll be successful well her opponent tonight deanna bennett uh, she had a really a tragic injury in her last fight against liz carmuch but she looked good in that fight what does she need to do tonight to pull as you just said laura into that you know that brawler match that she would want her to expend that energy she's got to pull the dog fight out of alejandro laura if she can do that i think she'll make laura fight at a pace that 
she's not comfortable with. She's shown that. If Deanna Bennett just sticks and moves, never stands directly in front of Lara, I think that will frustrate her, and that will make her chase after her. Lara, like I said, she loves to fight, and so she wants to get out there. She wants the exchanges. Deanna Bennett needs to fight smart. She did with Liz Carmouche, and she was going into that third round, 1-1. One, one. She did everything right. Obviously, unfortunate incident where she pulled the, her hamstring off the bone. She has six anchors now in her hamstring to hold it back after surgery a year away. She says she feels great, but we're going to find out tonight. We will. It's pretty incredible to think about that injury, but she did say she is ready. This is what she calls the biggest fight of her career. Um, hoping to win over a fifth rake. Lara will move her into, uh, you know, the rankings next week. All right. Well, tonight we have two Gracies fighting on our card. Name and Gracie. He's taking on Mark Leminger on our main card. But up next, it's his cousin Highland Gracie who will be making his Bellator debut when he takes on Shane Keeve. Now, that makes Highland the 23rd member of the Gracie family to compete in mixed, uh, professional mixed martial arts. So 76% of their wins have come by submission. Now get this, 174 fights between all of them. They have only been submitted twice. And Sean, there's a little bit more to that story, isn't there? There is because been submitted is an interesting kind of term because as we know, John, Sakuraba was responsible for both of them. Yes, he was. Uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, we're going way back. Obviously, this is Henzo and Hoyler, fights that were stopped. We had towels thrown in. These weren't the traditional submissions. I mean, no Gracie has ever slammed the mat and said, let me out of here, because I imagine it would be tough getting anything past you at Thanksgiving dinner if you did that. Yeah, you're not going to be welcome to any family affair anymore. <laughs> That's just not the way they look at things. And, it, you know, that came from, you know, the heads of the families, Elio Gracie and Carlos Gracie. But... You're taking a look at Hoyler. Hoyler never tapped in that. The referee stopped it based upon a submission being placed in Kimura. So he thought it was going back too far. Hoyler didn't believe it, but that was the end of the fight. And then Henzo, he got his arm dislocated. That was the end of the fight, but they never tapped. And uh, Google the 90-minute uh, fight, by the way, between Sakuraba and Hoyler. It's, you know, the history goes on and on and on. The name goes on and on and on. Shane Keefe will try to become the second to ever get a submission victory over a Gracie. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll welcome to the cage, Shane Key. There's always that moment where it becomes real. So imagine being a kid from San Jose and you're invited to come train at AKA. Shane Key talks about walking in there the first day, poking his head around the corner, and who does he see? At AKA, his childhood hero in the flesh, putting in work, an absolute legend to him who he idolized his whole life, Luke Rockhold. <laughs> oh, wait, you didn't think I uh, 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 I was waiting. <laughs> I wouldn't blame him. <laughs> He's the most good-looking guy in the gym, actually, probably in the sport, so I understand why. <laughs> He's such a good sport, isn't he? He is. And now making his way, Holland Gracie. Well, we kind of implied it. Jerry Seinfeld used to do that bit about the name Jeeves. Like if you name your child Jeeves, you pretty much decided what his future is going to be and what his occupation is going to be. If your name is Gracie, uh, you have to wear that name. Holland, the grandson of Helio, cousin of Hoist and Naaman. Returns to the pro cage after 14 years away. Obviously, like most of the family, he spent so much of that time teaching. But it's really fascinating here after two, you know, early losses of years and years ago that he wants to come back and do this again. Well, you know, sometimes if this is what happens is you you want to you want to represent the family name. You want to be one of those guys, but you're not ready. Physically, you're not ready. Mentally, you're not ready. Now, at this time in his life, he says, I'm completely different. I am ready for this, and we're going to see. To Michael C. Williams. As soon as we check out the tail of the tape. Tail of the tape, real simple. Look at that. You were just talking about it. Helen has been gone for a while at 34 years of age, coming back into his second realm of MMA. We're going to see how he does against the 27-year-old Shane Key. It was worth the wait to get to Michael C. Williams. Always is. Tonight here at the Bellator 266 prelims will go to the welterweight division scheduled for three five-minute rounds introducing the blue corner 
at six foot one, weighing in 169.1 pounds, his professional record one and oh, he fights out of San Jose, California, Shea And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot two, weighing in 171 pounds even. As a professional, early on, he's 0-2. He fights out of San Francisco, California, Harlan Gracie. And your referee in charge, Blake Rice. Any of us who want to be judged in our mid 30s by things we did when we were 20. But I'm not even going there. <laughs> That's the way it goes. <laughs> now, what's interesting about Shane Keefe's win it was a 68 second head kick TKO win, but the fight he won was against the state no gi jiu jitsu champion. Shane Keefe knows exactly what he's getting into, he understands what the skill set of Helen Gracie is. He believes that his stand-up to keep this fight on the feet with movement, a good stiff jab, sometimes heavy shots to the body, and make it to where Howland starts to take really bad shots at the takedown, starts to overextend and catch him and knock him out. 30 years ago saying, well, I'm just going to keep Gracie on his feet. <laughs> How many hundreds of guys have said that? Quite a few. Kick solid, not blocked at all in any way by Grace. That's got through. Yeah, this is what he's talking about. Nice straight jab, heavy right hand, hit him with a hook. We'll see if he starts getting into the top of Yep. Yeah. Oh, he's in trouble. Yeah, he's in big trouble. That is not the way he won it on the ground. He's turned his back here. Good at all. Blake Rice taking a look at this. Very nice job by Shane Keith. He was great, remained calm. Even had his glove being held on too. He knows that he can hurt his opponent. Now he's just looking for that opportunity to make it happen again. He was desperate to get him off his feet. Use of it to prevent it going down. And they are right there. That's something you he stopped that takedown. Look at this. And he saw that coming. Wrapped up that right leg of Gracie. No matter how this ends up, Alan Gracie is happy where he's at yes. right now. What, we, what you're looking at, basically, Shane Keefe's got a cradle yeah. position right now. He almost a defensive. Well, yeah, he's using it in a defensive fashion, but that cradle is going to end up being pushed to the side. you got to be very careful how long you're going to hold on to it. Now into the guard. You see the time remaining in the round. Solomon Gracie uses time to get his head together or to do work. And that's the real question, exactly what you're saying, because when you've been bombed and you've been getting hit, you get to this position, it's just like, just give me a second. Yeah. Let me just collect myself. And the time passes by, and you haven't done anything, and your opponent all of a sudden gets out of the position. He needs to attack. He needs to make it to where Shane Keith is having to defend. Those guard it almost looked like he wanted to go rubber guard when he first got down there. Well, he was looking towards it. He was bringing it up like he was looking towards getting into a little plot of position to change and reverse the position. Shane's making a mistake. Look at where that left arm is at. It's off the ground underneath yeah. the back of Gracie. He needs to be very careful where he's putting his hands. Where do you want it? Again, I want those up on the bicep, on the shoulder area. Do not allow your hands to rest on the floor. They're doing nothing for you there. Now 
going to Mission Control. Yeah, he could take that, bring that all the way down. He didn't do it, but a lot of things to attack. He go for the go-go plata, he go for that Uma plata. Perfect opportunity to swing into an Umaplata, switch the position, or go for the submission. Shane Keefe trying to stay safe. A tail of two rounds here in the first five minutes. Shane Keefe dominating on the feet. Alan Grace is doing enough here in the final two minutes on the ground to get it back. Probably not. No, he's not going to get it back. He was in, he was in trouble. The fight actually ending where right now Keith has not had that kind of situation. Nothing more than a high guard that yep. you saw there. Both guys going to the wrong corner. I always <laughs> love that. <laughs> well, if he's walking that way, I'm going to walk the other way. Where's your seat? You'd be amazed how many times in an NBA game they line up the wrong way in the middle oh, for a jump ball. That's great. All right, this is the damage Shane Keith did early. Yeah, check out the left hook. That hits him right Back on the, the edge of that jawline, the ear. That shook him up, and then he gets, starts to get hit with some big shots here. Nice uppercut. Doesn't land flush, but it does damage. Right hand then touches him. You see Gracie now diving for takedowns. He's doing a good job with his feet, moving his feet, keeping himself at a distance where he can land with power. Do those last two minutes move a potential 10-8 situation into a 10-9? Absolutely it does. It brought it back, that ground work, although you know he wasn't able to lock anything up, it made it to the point where it slowed the fight down and he was able to show the judges, you know what, that wasn't bad enough to keep me from actually having an advantage in this, this position. I think it went to a 10-9. Biggest problem for Howard Gracie right now is as simple. This thing starts every round on the feet. Yeah. He's got to figure out a way to get this back onto the mat. He's telegraphing that that right hand. That was telegraphed big time. He tries to throw it again in that fashion. You're going to see Keith landing with a beautiful left hook. Not nearly as aggressive coming out here in round two. Yeah, Keith is looking to counter. He's, he's yeah. looking for, you saw him what Gracie threw out the first time. He wants him to throw that again yeah. so he can counter it, but you can wait too long. Just get after doing what you were successful with in the beginning of this fight. Can't counter a shot that's not coming. Exactly. <laughs> there is, obviously, there is a uh, lack of velocity in the stand up of Hollywood Gracie on uh, these shots. Really see them coming. Again, that's the opposite difference between being 34 and being 20. After an eventful round one, neither wants to get caught in the other's game here in round two. Both guys really slowing this down. Allen looking for an opportunity to possibly get into a clinch position. And you see that Keith is just waiting, waiting, waiting. He's waiting too long to try to throw a counter strike and he believes he can land a little bit. Keith background is wrestling. He was wrestling from the time he was nine years old. Wrestling in junior college or something like freedom. First round when the fight went to the ground. Keith should continue to throw that kick. He, every time he's throwing that kick, he is landing it solid. People say, oh, leg kick, no big deal. Well, first of all, it hurts, and it changes up the guy getting hit. See, I've seen him get less patient. 
not only less patient, it makes it to where you don't have the strength in that leg to accomplish the things that you need to do to be successful in the fight. It takes away your balance, it takes away your strength. The one I always remember, the one that sticks out to me, was Lima getting the title back from Korskov. He kept hitting him with those leg kicks, and Korskov just got impatient. He couldn't do what he wanted to, and he opened himself up to get knocked out. You have someone that's landing a good leg kick in the back of your mind. You're telling yourself, I can't let that happen. I can't let that happen again. And the more it happens, the more you start to get concerned and you start taking chances. That's when your opponent can take that opportunity to put you away in the fight. I wonder all those stats that Jen was running and all those hundreds of fights, thousand rounds that races have fought, how many of them have been entirely on feet? <laughs> not, when it is, they're not happy with the results. This is the kind of round, though, if you're Shane Keefe, you're winning this round barely. Yeah. But it could change with one shot. And so why are you going to sit there and play that, that edge game? There's, just continue to go to his body. Pick him apart. Multiple shots. He's trying right now to land one, two, throw, throw one low, low leg kick. Not enough volume and definitely not enough in combination. Two minutes, two to three minutes of this fight could not have gone better for Shane King. Wow. And again, look at what happens. Even though that was semi hot, it still landed. And look at what happened with Gracie. All of a sudden going back immediately. Here's that kick near the end of the round. Look, it comes up under the arm, does hit the back of the head a little bit, but he felt it. Not that it hurt him, but he felt it. And that's what made him move away. And that's what Shane Keefe needs to do and go after in this third round. In my opinion, Shane Keefe basically took off that second round. It's not that he, he didn't lose it. He won the, the round, but he should have a lot of energy and he should be going after Alan Gracie in this round. Shane Keefe has a fan living his best Ready? life. Ready? That I can tell you. <laughs> well, he won't be talking very loud by the end of this. No. <laughs> now, Shane Keefe starts out a little stronger. Stop the leg kick. Well, Rob Kessler from AKA is in the corner of Shane Keefe. Outstanding coach. He was a good competitor when he was fighting in MMA. I'm sure, I didn't get to hear what he said, but I'm sure he told him, look, I need more out of you. I need more output. I need you to go after him. He doesn't have any power in his hand. He can't hurt you. Let's go. See, right there, you're watching how Gracie when he throws the kick, but he's off balance. His offense is tentative, and it's, it's slow in developing, but you're right. He just, there's no confidence that comes with it. Exactly. But getting it to the ground is like changing from black and white to color in the Wizard of Oz. Yes, it, everything changes. It's all the difference in the world. I like the fact that how Gracie's going out, trying to use the jab. He's trying to come forward. Any more output, you got a 
little more out of her from Shane. Shane Keith, every time that he throws his hands, he should be hiding those kicks behind his hands. They're going to land, they're going to cause damage. He just needs to start committing to them. Every time he throws his hands, look at the reaction of Howard Gracie. He gets him to actually bring his hands either up towards his body. Now he's letting Howard Gracie start to have a little bit of momentum in this fight. They can change fast. Their left pushed him back. Alan Grace is starting to fight like a guy who's down two rounds to none and has got two and a half minutes left. Well, the one thing that Alan Grace has really found, he's found that jab because he's yeah. working for it. Nice right hand by Keith. Basic punch there is. It's working for him. Alan Gracie is winning this round on the feet. No doubt about it. And it's output. Look at the output. Keeps got a cut over his left eye. Now you go back and you wonder about the lack of output. Round two for Shane Keith. Well, for Shane Keith or Howard Gracie, because if he ends up losing this fight, it's gonna be round two. It's gonna be round two, and it's it's all on you. You have the ability to go. Everything you're seeing him do right here, stepping on the gas, going after him, making him deal with an offensive output. Where was this the first 10, 12 minutes? Exactly. Changes in ways we could not have imagined. Another strong shot. Again, as you said, all set up by the jab. Everything's been set up by the jab. Jab's working to perfection for him. Smile on the face of Shane Keith as Gracie misses badly. Go home overhand right. Strong finish. Keith trying to finish like he started. This one, this one got interesting. We could remove that second round and had a really good fight. First round was very interesting. Good work by Shane Keefe in the beginning of it. Good work on the ground. And then third round, outstanding output by Howard Gracie. Threw and landed much more Alive, in round three than he did in the first two rounds combined. Some of the action here. Here's that jab, and then the right hand coming in. Back to the jab. Right hand again. That was a nice right hand by Keith. Didn't really hurt him that bad, but landed cleanly. And Gracie again going after the left and the right overhand right. The jab was the big difference in this round. Gracie was able to utilize that jab and make it to where Keith had problems with it and set everything up for him. Proud of you, man. That was a good match. 
third round to Gracie, first two to keep. Is that how you saw it? That's the way I see it. There's no doubt about the first round, and there's no doubt about the third round. It all comes down to that second. And like I said, you know, you could be in a position where you didn't do enough, and you lose this fight based upon that. Shame on you because you had the ability to go. Michael C. Williams has the answers we're looking for. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. All three, Sean Dallas Hall, Wade Vera, and Jason Herzog. Seed exactly the same, 29 to 28. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Shane Key. Gracie is going to go back. He's going to watch that second round and know I could have done more. It might have been a different outcome. I want to Gracie spends as much time on the ground at the end of the fight, more time than during the fight. It usually doesn't end well. To Jen Brown. Well, thanks, Sean. Lots of fight action coming your way on Showtime tonight, 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. Now, a fight that has a lot of fight fans abuzz. It's our second fight of the night. We've got Georgie Karhanian. Uh, he's a veteran of the sport with 43 professional fights. Now, he is taking on British brawler Saul Rogers. Now, Rogers is making the move up to 155. And when we spoke with Saul this week, he talked about how he had changed up his whole routine for this camp, changed up his diet, his sleep routine, his mindset. Josh, what do you think about Saul? making that move to lightweight. I was wondering what took him so long. I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, I saw him at the weigh-ins. They both look about the same size. Saul Rogers looks physically thicker, though, and bigger. When I saw him in the meetings this week, I, I, thought, I thought, oh, Georgie looks bigger. But then when they the, see him at the weigh-ins, it was like, wow. Everyone has always talked about how strong Saul Rogers is. Everyone that's fought him, and that was at 145. Him going up to 155, I think we're going to see a rejuvenated Saul Rogers. You saw the smile on his face this week. He posted a picture on his Instagram, and I saw, he's like, this is one hour after I made weight. He looked depleted in his last fight. He showed a picture of himself this week, one hour after. He was smiling and joking with people. That's a big difference in your personality going into a fight. But Georgia Carhani, he got that memo because he made the move up to lightweight about five fights ago. This will be a six fight at 155, and he's looked great. He's looked great here. That's exactly what Saul Rogers is trying to do. He, Georgie beat him to the punch, and he's understood that, look, success, because I was cutting on the weight, wasn't as good, and it didn't, it, it, the week of the fight is miserable. Now he can enjoy his food. His performances have been better. You can see the strength transferred for him. Also, during that week, mentally, it wears on you, understanding that you can't eat, you can't drink, you can't do those things. For a lot of us, like for myself, I felt like it was a mindset, okay, look, mentally I'm prepared, I'm ready to go. But some fighters, they didn't have the energy to keep going because they cut so much weight. And I think when you saw with Georgie, Georgie was able to make those changes, and he did. And when he made it, he's had success at 155. This is his home. He's here to stay. We got two guys coming in feeling real good. Fight of the night possible? Yeah. Oh, you know, for sure. I, I've been on this fight all week, and I think it's going to be the fight of the night. All right. Well, uh, there you have it. Uh, Josh John, uh, uh, Josh says there he thinks it's going to be fight of the night. Uh, Sean Big John, I know you guys are excited about this one as well. I can't. I cannot wait for this fight. Everything that Josh Thompson says, and this kills me to say it, is so right. What is with you two? I know it's horrible. Well, those familiar with the California scene think that in terms of the prelims, this might be the fight of the night between two hard hitters at 175. And now ready to make his way to the cage, Albert Big Hell Gonzalez. Hard to imagine a more memorable first two Bellator fights than the one Fresno Albert Gonzalez went through a gruesome Anderson Silva-like injury. Ended his Bellator debut in 2019 and a stunning win last September when he essentially took such a pounding his opponent could not continue. That's how tough this young man is who has had his troubles in his childhood, lost his dad very early. His mom raised seven boys in and out of jail, and he has shown his toughness every time we've seen him inside the cage. You, you said everything, because if there's one thing we know is Albert Gonzalez is just dog dirty tough. And now set to make his way, Abraham 
by Saul. So we just talked about the Gracies. You may not be as familiar with the Anoa'i family, but with apologies to the Hearts and the Funks and the Von Erics, it may be pro wrestling's first family now with the success of The Rock and Roman Reigns. Well, Abraham, my son's uncle, is Rikishi. And John made his Bellator debut in this building in 2019, and he, he made the family proud in that fight. Yeah, he made a beautiful debut here in this arena. You can check out what he was able to do. He proved he's got big power. He is very physically strong. You see someone going after the submission. No, nope, doesn't get it. And look at the power shots that he lands. He just pounds his opponent to the point his opponent cannot take anymore. Physically a very, very strong and powerful man. 12 professional fights between these two. Only one has gone to the judges. To Michael C. Williams. For those joining us tonight, late night in the UK on BBC iPlayer, we welcome you inside the SAP Center as we go now to a contract weight fight at 175 pounds set. For three five minute crowds, introducing the blue corner at six foot four, weighing in 175 pounds even. His professional record two and two. He fights out of Fresno, California, Albert. Big hand, Gonzala. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot eleven, weighing in the same 175 pounds as a professional. Five wins, three losses from San Francisco, California. Abraham Vaisau. In charge, your referee Jason Herzog. Fans come out to watch fights and buy a ticket. This is the kind of fight they buy a ticket to see. Absolutely. You got one guy that's got huge power, one guy who's got a huge ready? heart. But you ready? Which one's going to take the win? Nice long ranging kick by Al. That's kickboxing has been his background. His entry, good first job by Maceo. With that right hand landed clean. You can see it stunned. Albert Gonzalez already. He felt it. Nice job in fighting it off. But Maceo just too powerful, too strong. See if Albert Gonzalez can work his way back to his feet here. Wow. Oh, the uppercut. That was a lead hand uppercut, too. It's something you don't see a lot of guys do. Six three. Sal would five eleven if you were wondering. This fight is turning into exactly what we had talked about: the power of Sal. Can Albert work his way through it? Because if there's one thing we know about Gonzalez, he is going to be nonstop. He's going to come forward. He's going to pressure you. He's going to try to wear you out and use cardio as a weapon. Gonzalez using the kickboxing with his huge reach advantage. You see the distance it creates. Oh, he's going to try. Look at all you got over there. Legs are in big trouble. Gonzalez in big trouble. This is what we said, the sound, big power. Down he goes. Trouble. And we're done. And 
you know, Jason Herzog knows that Albert Gonzalez would have just gone on and on and on. Yeah, no, Jason Herzog did exactly, exactly the right. right thing at the right time. Take a look at the replay here. You'll see the big shots that Fasayu hits him with. Abraham lands that clean left right to the temple. You see the legs. Watch the legs of Gonzalez. They are all over the place. Brings the knee up into the body. Uppercut misses, but that right hand over the top lands again, and he starts to go out from Jason has seen enough. You saw he's just instinctively worried about his mouthpiece as opposed to defending himself. Exactly. I saw with a full blooded Samoan, so proud of it. Let's go! Another impressive knockdown here in Bellator. Six wins, all by knockout. Thank you. Nice win by Abraham Masao. Oh. We promised you fireworks. There was never going to be anything subtle about that fight. Hey, Buggy, I love you. Thank you, Buggy. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage referee, Jason Herzog steps in, waves off the contest due to strikes official time. Two minutes, 17 seconds into round number one. The winner by knockout. Great performance there. A fantastic fight as we roll on here through our prelims. Now, tonight we've got a five fight main card coming your way on Showtime, 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. Here's a look at what you have to look forward to. Coming up later tonight, no undefeated Christian Edwards. He will face Ben Parrish at 205. And Sal Rogers and Georgie Carhanian promise to deliver fireworks tonight. And of course, the female flyweights, Alejandra Lara and Deanna Bennett, promise to also deliver an exciting matchup. Now, number uh, four ranked Neiman Gracie. He looks to bounce back and hopes a dominant performance over Mark Lemonger will put him back in title contention. And in our main event, Phil Davis aims to reestablish himself in the division when he takes on Bellator MMA newcomer Yoel Romero. And for more on this matchup, let's head back over to London and Gareth A. Davies. Yoel Romero and Phil Davis meet tonight in a main event pitching two light heavyweights with vast experience and top-level wrestling, both with so much to gain from victory. Olympic silver medalist Romero makes his belated Bellator debut, knowing that a triumph here tonight will likely propel the famous Cuban into a debate for an early 2022 title shot. He'll be looking to use his hulking presence to control the tempo of the fight and explode in bursts with those hands of stone. Davis, meanwhile, seeks to rebound from a unanimous decision defeat to incumbent champion Vadim Nemkov and maintain his position high in the divisional ladder. Will it be another W for Mr. Wonderful by will and skill? Or can the soldier of God march onto the main stage now and lie in wait? for the winner of the World Light Heavyweight Grand Prix. We are set for an epic encounter between two seasoned veterans, and we cannot wait. We echo that sentiment from Gareth A. Davies. And here's the thing, John. A casual fan will say, hey, two great wrestlers, two high-level wrestlers, but that's like saying that Pavarotti and Mariah Carey are both singers, right? They're completely different in the way they wrestle. Absolutely, and that's the big thing when you're taking a look at the way Yoel Romero was a freestyle wrestler internationally, and that's a big part of the takedown game. That's a guy that you're taking the guys down and you're turning them. Where Phil Davis was strong, that's folk style wrestling out of Division I NC2A wrestling. He's good at riding his opponent. He's good at being in the top position, so it is a difference. Look, if you're going to go credential for credential, Yoel Romero, there's no one really in, you know, the heavy divisions of MMA that's going to match his wrestling pedigree. But Phil Davis, trust me, he's dang good. 
Pavarotti also struggled making weight a couple of times. <laughs> And now, ready to make his way to the cage, Socrates Hernandez. Another pro debut. And think about, John, how many of these take place in dimly lit, small venues. Where here's a kid from San Jose making his pro debut, and he is strutting and walking the ramp at the SAP Center. He is loving life right now. Look at Socrates is coming out here. He's got all of his fans out here. People that have watched him in the amateurs, they want to see him in his pro debut. His striking is good. He uses his length very tall for the division. We're going to see exactly how well that striking matches up against his opponents. And we now welcome his opponent, Bobby the Humble Warrior. Another pro debut and another California kid, but hey, it was Bobby Serrano has a little secret. His whole life, he spent summers with his grandparents in Hawaii, which has given him a completely different background. Bellator tried to sign him three years ago, and it was his dad, John, that told him, hey, you're not ready yet. After four wins as an amateur, the feeling was at 23, now it's time. Well, he comes from a Kaja Kempo background. You know, we're talking, when you talk about Kaja Kempo, you're talking about guys like Chuck Liddell. You know, his coach in John Hackleman. This kid's got good stand up. He's got very good wrestling and he's got submission. So he used to wrestle. He is someone that's well rounded. We're going to see how he does here tonight against a guy that we know has got very good stand up. Google Kaju Kembo kids. It's fascinating to think how far ahead of the game that concept was based in Hawaii. Let's check out the tail of the tape. A pair of pro debuts. Look at it all says it right there. They're both young. The guys are both of these guys actually switched opponents because their opponents didn't do something right, didn't make weight. These guys said we want to fight. They matched them up. Pro debut. This should be fun. To Michael C. Williams. From San Jose, California, the Bellator 266 prelims roll on as we go now to the Bantam Weight Division scheduled for three. Five minute rounds introducing the blue corner at five foot 11, weighing in 135.9 pounds, making his professional debut. He fights out of San Jose, California, Socrates Hernandez. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot seven, weighing in 135.4. He too tonight makes his professional debut fighting out of Vallejo, California. Bobby, the humble warrior, Serrano. In charge of the action, new referee Frank Trigg. Good. Yeah, you got a guy, two pro debuts, and the referee's got 30 professionals. Yeah, how about that? Fight. Speaking of memorable, <laughs> iconic go. moments inside the cage. Ready? Ready? Fight! So, Kaja Kembo created it in Hawaii in the 40s. World War II era when it was thought to be very important. Be able to defend yourself. Oh. She buckles the knees of Socrates Hernandez. He's running away. Right. Serrano. Serrano needs to settle down a little bit. Those are wild shots, but a couple of them landed. Well, look at Serrano's eyes right now in the front of you. They can't be any wider. The human body will allow it. That's the way to control the fight. That's the way to settle yourself down. Nice ground and pound attack by Serrano. He's putting himself in a place where he can hurt his opponent and not be hurt. This is called being very smart. He's got a real opportunity here to get in. Socrates Hernandez just lost his mouthpiece. Looked like. Oh, still there. He's trying to get it back in. 
it's a good thing because he has taken big shots here. And Socrates has the problem he's got is his right arm was being controlled. And a suplex on top. Bringing it right back down to the ground. Beautiful job by Serrano. Well, the first two professional minutes for Bobby Serrano have been spectacular. Not sure how many more we're going to get to see. Serrano just catching his breath a little bit. He's had a lot of output. How many pro debuts do you have chanting your name? Not bad. Both guys have a lot of fans here right now. That was a good left hand. Big heavy shots. I love the posture that I'm seeing right now out of Bobby. Socrates is hanging tough, but he has taken a lot of damage in this round. Asking you shall receive. Actually, asking Socrates for name is what we There you go. It's more like your wishes might come out. Now he's controlling that arm. That's caused Socrates a lot of problems in this fight so far. He hasn't been able to defend on that side. Bobby needs to settle his hips back down. Look towards getting his hooks in. Subtle jump, but I love the fact that he knew he didn't have that and he backed off it. Exactly. Right now he's in a position he knows that he has no control of the lower body of Socrates Hernandez, so he needs to be very aware of when he can slip that hook in. Socrates Hernandez showing a lot of composure going, I'm going to get hit, but I need to push his hips back so I can get myself out of this position. When you consider the amount of damage he has already taken, and he's still thinking through the fight that way, that's really impressive. But this has been dominant. And he's just trying to roll with it, get through these final 40 seconds. You can see that in his Bobby is tired from his output and Socrates is exhausted from being pounded on. As if there wasn't enough adrenaline dump anyway in a double pro debut. Absolutely. Again, love the posture. How he's great posture. Comes up, heavy shots coming down. You can't ask for anything more right now for Bobby. First five professional minutes for Bobby Cerrone could not have gone better. And full marks for Socrates Hernandez for being able to walk back to the corner. And walk back with, with, with some oomph, too. Yeah. Yep. You having fun? Yeah. Yeah? Deep breath, son. Same thing. Control that distance. All right, watch your, watch your energy when you come in and out. Break him up with that sidekick. Here's where it started. That, that right hand, then the left hook over the top. You can see it stunned him big. Here was that suplex coming down, brings him right over. Beautiful job of placing him back where he was dominant onto the ground and then the ground pound. Look at the posture. This is what we talk about. This is not little shots. When we talk about hitting someone with a shot on the ground, big knee shot, big punches, everything he's throwing has power impact and is doing damage. 10-8. That's a 10-8 round. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ready? Eyes remain Ready? wide and the face remains untouched. MVP 
Ben up here at the start of round two. When you get a guy that's you know, fighting from that karate style stance, using that very bladed, and they're gonna throw side kicks, you wanna think about slipping that leg to the side and then coming forward to attack your opponent in the counter. Two guys taking their very first step into 135 in Bellator, which got, believe it or not, even deeper this week. Yoji Oroguchi, the former champion, added to the rock. I mean, it's getting surging out of the family. Oh, my God. Screaming for a grand boot. Loving it. And there is the second trip to Suplex City. Riding his hips right up in the mouth. Socrates, again, he's taking a lot of damage. You can see it's starting to wear on him. He doesn't know how to stop it when you're in there and you're doing everything you can and nothing's working for you. It becomes very frustrating. Emotionally, it becomes draining. Nice job of moving the hips by Socrates Hernandez to get it back to half guard. And you're seeing, his coach is saying the exact right thing. You're seeing Socrates grab that wrist, push it up the side. What you want to see from Bobby is slide your knee up on top, trap that arm. Now that'll free your hand and you can actually come with a punch or an elbow. Calling for the shoulder strike, then he got his arm free and got two more big forearms. the variety of the offense. And there's such a difference. People, a lot of people are going to look and they're going to say, well, Socrates, he's throwing, he's, he's punching back. He has no power on those punches. He has, doesn't have the ability to create power from his position while the shots he's absorbing have a lot. Gravity is working with Bobby Serronio. He's trying to defend the tsunami with an umbrella right now. Could have said it better. Exactly. He is to the unending credit of Socrates Hernandez. He has taken eight minutes of abuse here. And he's still working to stay in this fight. Very, very tough. Nice push off. Every time Socrates has something that works for him, he gets himself to a better position. It ends up being taken away. Again, take a look at his right arm. It is now under the control of Bobby Seronio. energy he's got left. At least the room is smart you know, compared to his corner because one of his corner men was telling the knee to the head while his opponent was in a grabbing yeah. position. So we're we going for number three here. He's got that hand in position for a high crotch. You can do a lot of things right now. Times you see pro debut against pro debut, and you roll your eyes a little bit and say, well, What are we going to get out of this? This has been a remarkable 10 minutes to watch. It's an outstanding effort by both guys. Fuck. 
Three times, you're doing good. Five more minutes, one more round. How you feeling? Yeah? Let me drink, come on, drink. Take a deep breath in. All right, son, you're doing a great job. Again, control the distance with this. Sorry, you gotta let your hands go, baby. This is everything you got. You're gonna lose the fight if you don't let your hands go. Do you understand me? Sorry, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Come on, baby. Let's go. We train our ass off. This ain't nothing. We felt this shit before. Hey, when he's gonna try to take your back then you need to sit down. You can't just let him toss through you like that. He's standing up high. He's down. Stop. Let your hands go, baby. This is our only chance. Let your fucking hands go. He goes in for the You're hesitating. You're hesitating. Okay, so let your hands go. Gotta let him go, baby. Gotta let him go. So last round. Let's go. Let's go. I'm not sure how much opportunity he's had to let his hands go. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much, how effective that coaching is at this time. And you're telling him let his hands go. I think he knows to let his hands go. He's just not been given the opportunity, as you're saying. Going to be competitive. Okay. We're watching close. All right. What you're seeing right now, that's the ringside position coming in. That is the referee, Frank Trigg, bringing him in and just basically setting up the possibility of, hey, I'm not going to let you take that much more Third abuse round. in this fight. So I want Ready? you to know I need more Ready? out of you so fight. I don't have to stop the fight. We watch you closely. Here are the words. so low, he's walking forward, he's being tough, but he's not being technical. Socrates Hernandez fans here had that brief glimmer of hope as those elbows are running down because there's something to cheer about. Looking towards the triangle, he's nowhere close to it at this moment. He's got the legs in place. He's trying to grab that shin, lock it in tighter. Still a lot of space. He needs to get that arm across. Neither arm is in a position for that triangle to work at this time. He's got the legs in place for it, but he doesn't have the angle and he doesn't have the arm in place to create the pressure on that carotid artery. For those who haven't seen this, where does his arm need to be? He needs to take that arm and cross it over the body, get it into his waistline. You'll see that arm crossing over, so then it actually makes the shoulder put pressure on that carotid artery, which is going to choke him unconscious. It's East Hernandez, BJJ Brown Belt. Should do is switch that triangle, reverse it into a different position, then squeeze both sides because right now it's not going to work based upon the arm placement that he has with Seronio. There he's trying to cross it over. You see he's trying to cross it over right there. Bring it across. Now if you get to a position, he can cross Seronio. Now he's changing the angle. It's getting a lot tighter. Seronio needs to be careful, but he's getting his arm free back to the center. So see, take a look at where his foot's at on that cap. Now it's not near as tight. There's space inside. Those three or four inches make all the difference, all the difference in the world. But he could go into switching towards, trying to work towards an arm bar here. giving you absolutely everything in their pro debut. Absolutely, and this is what I love about MMA because for two rounds, Bobby Cerrone has been dominating this fight, and now he finds himself in this position, he's asking himself, how did I get here? 
but the fight could end and he could end up losing this if Socrates can pull this off. You can't score four touchdowns in the final minute. You're not going to score 20 runs in the bottom of the ninth. But ask our buddy Chael. It can happen when you don't win in a fight. And all it takes is that one moment. Those are some big shots. Again, he doesn't have the arms where he needs to have them. So, yes, he's got the triangle position, but there is no triangle there right now. See, Socrates is just trying to readjust that leg to get it back behind the knee. See both hands inside. That's a good position right now for Bobby. This is Socrates trying to cross that arm over. Bobby's going, uh uh. Self safe. Uh, you never forget your first. Every judge, you're going to see things a different way. If I told you 10 minutes ago, Socrates Fernandez would win the third round <laughs> after the beating he had taken, that's extraordinary. It shows what kind of heart he has, yeah. it shows he has no quit in him. He should be very proud of himself, proud of the effort that he put out. He fought a very tough guy, a very technical guy. It wasn't his night to win the fight, in my opinion. But man, he proved something about who he is. You have nothing to apologize for, you man. Everything. Nothing. Everything. These were the elbows. This is what occurred, and you saw when he was going for the takedown, those elbows brought it to the point where he made that mistake of allowing that leg to come up. He gets the takedown, but they did have an effect, and then you see Socrates bring that triangle into effect. He grabs his shin. He tries to tighten it down. Bobby knew what was going on, but the elbows, they kind of rocked him a little bit, and he needed to gain that moment of time. Gets himself caught, and then didn't want to make the big mistake in trying to get out and allowing that to actually take the fight from him, so he stayed there. A little bit of ground and pound. Great job by both guys. Michael C. Williams will make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go to the judges' scorecards. Your first judge, George Allen, scores the fight 29 to 27. Well, judges Ron McCarthy and Michael Bell both see it exactly the same, 29 to 26. I'll have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Bobby, the humble warrior. Those are two humble warriors in there who will never forget their pro debuts. That was a treat to watch. To Jen Brown. Well, thanks, Sean. Two more fights coming your way here on the Bellator YouTube prelims before we move over to Showtime for a five-fight card stacked with big names and prospects. Now we have Bellator veterans like Carl Hanyan, a former champion, and Phil Davis, and, of course, Yoel Romero in his Bellator debut. Now we also have the jiu-jitsu namesake, Naaman Gracie. He's making his return to the cage. And for more on this matchup, we're going to go back over to the U.K. and Gareth A. Davies. The meeting of Mark Leminger and Neiman Gracie at welterweight tonight presents the classic MMA duel of striker versus grappler. Leminger has much to gain here. The Wisconsin native will look to keep the fight standing and build on that second round TKO over Demarcus Jackson in June. But for the motorcycle aficionado, it will be no easy ride against the jiu-jitsu ace. Gracie, ranked number four at welterweight, looks to bounce back 
back after what I think was a debatable decision defeat to Jason Jackson in his last fight. The fluid fighter whose stand-up skills are improving exponentially to add to his dangerous ground game, of course, will aim to tie his opponent into a veritable knot. Will Gracie get hands on Leminger, or will the American get another win here and throttle himself into the top 10 rankings? Well, Leminger told us this week that his game plan is to keep the fight on the feet, as we just heard from Gareth. He says, I don't think that Naaman, uh, you know, can exploit me when it comes to the feet. But he also said, I'm not concerned with being taken down by Naaman. What do you think of that game plan? Well, because his wrestling's so good. That's why he's not concerned by it. But what he doesn't understand is that Naaman Grace is really good at getting the double underhooks and getting to the takedown position. But Leminger is very good in terms of getting to the top position, doing dirty work in terms of dirty boxing, but from the ground and pound position. In that fight against Smith, when they first came out to touch gloves, Smith dropped him right off the bat, and he was able to fight back, get the takedowns, dominate the top position, and then you see here against Jackson doing the same thing. He actually came out, got the takedown, pushed the pace so fast that Jackson's get, cardio ran out, and just dominated the rest of all the wrestling exchanges as well as the ground and pound. But that is not the way he should be fighting Gracie. Now look, I'm okay with him getting a takedown or two, but not playing that jujitsu game with him. He needs to make sure that the guard is up. He needs to make sure his hands are on the biceps or in the in the armpits. He needs to control every position and every aspect when he is on the ground. And if he feels any danger at all, backing out. But I think for the way for him to win this fight is on the feet, utilizing his wrestling to sprawl and brawl and letting the boxing go. Well, Naaman Gracie, he told us, look, uh, I'm not gonna do anything different than I normally do, right? I'm gonna look to take a guy down. I'm to submit him though he also said I've got you know some tricks up my sleeve when it comes to striking so what do you think we're gonna see from him tonight well he lo he's learned a lot from Rafael Cardero working with him on the feet as well but what he said is that he loves about working with Rafael is that he's not trying to change me and you said he's gonna be the same fighter sure he's gonna do all the same things the reason why is because it's working all right and so if he can keep continuing to get people down with his body locks his he doesn't shoot double legs. Sure, I've seen him get double legs against Ed, Ed Ruth, three-time national champ out of Penn State, and a teammate of mine. It shocked everybody that he was able to out-wrestle him in certain positions and get in the takedown. But when he got to the top position, he is just dominant. And what he likes to tell people, and what a lot of top jiu-jitsu guys like to tell people is that he forces you to make mistakes. He knows where you're going because that's how good he is. So he puts that pressure and makes them go the way he already knows the answers to one, two, and three in the next moves. And that right there is why he is so good. So many steps ahead of him. It's so true. All right. Well, he does want to bounce back from uh, suffering that last loss uh, to Jason Jackson. Uh, well, Lemmer, he wants to get a win over a ranked opponent. He's hoping that will break him into the top 10 next week. Lots on the line for both of these fighters. All right. Let's head back down for some more fight action. Sean? All right, Jen. Neiman Gracie feels like he's got... Yaroslav Amosov's number, he's the right guy. Middleweight, meanwhile, a little under the radar in Bellator these days. Gegard Mousasi just defended his title. It certainly looks like Austin Vanderford's next, fresh off his cameo on AEW this week. is next in line. Looking for a dark horse? You might be about to see him. And now, we welcome to the cage, Anthony Sugarfoot Adams. Five years ago, Anthony Adams had potential, solid Muay Thai background, but MMA was just a dream. But after too many days out of job building railroad tracks on 100 degree weather in Wyoming, he said, you know what, I'm going to make my way to elevation. And he's been rising ever since. Undefeated in the regionals, a couple of narrow decision losses in the contender series. John, he's the underdog here, there's no question, but this is not one to sleep on. No, he is not. He is, he is the underdog. You're absolutely right. But he comes from a great camp. He trains with great people. He's got good stand-up. He is very explosive on the feet, and his wrestling is not bad, but it is not of the level of Merzlaev where he can just challenge him back and forth. So he needs to be very cautious about when he extends to try to do the damage that he can do with his hands. And now his opponent, Hakhlid Murtazali. Some fighters are just destined to stay under the radar. Three years ago, Khalid Murtzalia fought veteran C.B. Dalloway and out of competition, positive test for steroids, and the controversial non-stoppage of that fight is what people remember. 
not the actual fight itself, which a 25-year-old from Dagestan simply destroyed a tough battle-tested UFC veteran. 13 of his 15 wins by knockout. John, this is a very dangerous fighter who is just entering his prime. Boy, you just said it. He is just entering his prime because he is still young. He's young in the sport, even though he's had a lot of fights. But he's so good in the wrestling that his stand-up is even better as far as he knows that I can take the fight to the ground anytime. So I will take chances in the stand-up. We'll see if he does it here tonight. The tale of the tape doesn't show you here is that he obviously, because of the suspension and injuries, has been largely inactive the last couple of years. Very true. That reach of 72.5, meaning he's got to get inside. We'll see if Anthony Adams can keep him on the outside and at, and at, at bay. Tonight here at Bellator 266, the prelims continue now with three five-minute rounds in the middleweight division. Introducing first the blue corner at six foot one, weighing in 185.3 pounds in his Bellator debut. He enters with eight professional victories, two losses, fighting out of Aurora, Colorado, Anthony Sugarfoot. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner at six foot, weighing in 185.3 pounds as a professional. 15 wins, two defeats from Mahatskala Dagestan, Russia, presenting Halid Makazali. In charge, your referee, Blake Grice. The reason Mertzaliev is not in the top 10 at 185, that could change with a win here. Talked about the reach disadvantage. Watch the body kick, the liver shot from Mertzaliev. He will go for it. because Anthony Adams goes by the name Sugarfoot. The original Sugarfoot is a guy named Peter Cunningham from Alberta, Canada, one of the greatest kickboxing fighters of all time. Right now, he's not being quite sure, but he's being pretty steady in where he's at because he wants to be able to move quickly if there is a takedown attempt by Khalid. Talked about elevation for Anthony Adams, his training partner, Grant Neal, coming up. And highly anticipated fight next with Alex Belizzi in this month of light heavyweights here in Bellator. A lot of you rummaging around online. There is major news regarding the light heavyweight Grand Prix we're going to have for you when we go live on Showtime in about an hour. Said for Murtha's layup, just his second fight essentially in the last two and a half years. What do you lose with inactivity like that in the middle of your career? Use the timing of the fight. You know, you can do training and you're in the gym and you're all that, but the fight just seems much faster for you. It's at a different pace, it's at a different intensity. So when you get back, you've got to realize exactly what that speed is at. But right now, Khalid is looking very good. His chin is in a great position. He's landing clean shots. You see that Anthony is trying to keep him at length. I love that Anthony is bringing his kicks at least up high to don't get rid of them, bring them up high because they're hard to catch there and they can be effective. One of the things you're seeing from Anthony Adams, watch how you see how he's turning his body. He goes from a bladed position and then all of a sudden his left shoulder is dropping back and his right shoulder is coming forward. At one of those times, look for the lead to take advantage of that, either stepping in with a big heavy shot or coming in for that double leg. He used to use the term people may not know, bladed position. 
Flips it. Any, anytime you're talking about a stance, right now you're looking at Anthony Adams. He's in the orthodox stance, meaning that his left foot is forward. He's a right-handed fighter, and he's blading his body, giving you less of his body to attack. He doesn't want to stand square, but in MMA, we stand much squarer than a boxer based upon takedown attempts. If you're square, it's easier to defend it. When you're bladed, it's very difficult to defend that takedown. So spinning back into the Andre Korshkov look. Andre Korshkov will be fighting in Moscow. It wasn't a shot that landed, it was him kicking and being off balance. That's what put him down, but Anthony right now doing a very nice job of keeping that length. He's creating problems for Khalid as far as him getting inside on him. You can see the power of those strikes. You can see that there's some snap on that. Very little wasted motion. Position where he's fighting to keep himself from being on the deck. The tell that he heard him was Murtis Lee going for that takedown, which he almost never does. Big shots late in the round for Anthony Adams. Side by Anthony. Yeah, strong finish. Turn round one. Beautiful work. Have a seat for me. Gertz, will you hold that for me? Big deep breath. Big deep breath. Give me another big deep breath. Let's get this ice up now, guys. Hey. You Take that up. Give me a big deep breath. Hey, I need you to either go first or fake to draw it out because you're just kind of waiting on him. He's only throwing power punches. So let's draw that out and counter the counter, or you just go first, okay? Go first a little. And keep going on that low kick, okay? You agree with that? His legs all right. Absolutely. Okay, I want you to go first. Say the right Use thing. Use your feet, know where you're at. You saw how he's going to wrestle. That's what he does when he gets in trouble. We know that's coming. Big deep breath. Let's go to work. Let's go to work. Also, what we said. the back, bro. Let's get it in there. Murtis Leo doesn't really go to that. Well, based upon the fact that everyone got used to. Habib Nurmagomedov yep. being a guy that was always looking for the takedown, always going for it. They think that every Dagestani fighter, fighter yeah. fights that Back way, up. and they don't. Back they up. all have their own styles. They're all good at the Ready. wrestling, Ready. but they, a lot of them have a stand-up style. Well, they want to keep the fight on the feet. That's where they feel most comfortable. There's Liam now doing his work at Jackson Wink. Nice front kick. Very clean. You like those early in the round, too, because they make you think. They definitely get your attention quick. That an Anthony Adams isn't necessarily one of these guys. We've seen a couple of Malik Polizzi come under next days who say, when you ask about their opponent, I don't watch film. I'm not, and I don't, maybe it's my background being different. I, I've, I'm always baffled by that. I get if you don't want to talk about your other, your opponent, but this idea that I don't watch film, I don't, I, 
to me, it just seems like the natural evolution of this is you need to be watching a little film. Oh, no doubt in my mind, you should be watching film of your opponent because there's things for you to learn in that study. It's no different than football, baseball, basketball, all of them. You know, a pitcher's going to do certain things every time the same way. Well, same with a fighter when he's in there. He's going to throw the punch a certain way. He's going to follow it up with the same type of combination. And a lot of guys will say, oh, I have my coach watch that. Okay, I'm not saying that's bad. That's your system. But it does not hurt for you to watch it. I wonder if the, the percentage of guys that say that will go down five years from now, ten years from now. I don't know. You know, it's one of those. It, it, I, you do hear it quite often, and it's like, why? Yeah. Then if it's really true, why say it? <laughs> On top of it. Here's the of remaining patient. This corner was exactly right. He's not a high volume. It's power shots. Man, when he touches you, you know. Anthony Adams is doing a good job of controlling that space. He's the one that's dictating exactly when these engagements really occur because he's the guy that's throwing more often. And he's also giving some really good fakes. He's got a good fake with his kick set up. He's also bringing up that uppercut like he's going to throw it in time. And that is keeping Merciliev in a position where he's just not comfortable in executing fully with what he can do. A shot to the body by Khalid. Grizzlyev has a good cut over his left eye. And again, I love the fact that Anthony Adams is continuing to throw those kicks up high. Left jab took Adams off balance. Seeing some of the reach issues are certainly playing out. No doubt about it. You know, this is what we, when we talk about, you know, having an advantage with that reach, is that going to be a factor in the fight? It right now, it's a factor in this fight. For the most part, yes, you'll see Khalid at times being able to come inside and try to land, but it's Anthony Adams that's been the guy that's controlling that range. He's the one that's dictating when those engagements take place. In the corner saying that Murders Aliyev is going to shoot. I'm not so sure. Look at what you just saw. You saw four different feints from Anthony Adams, and you saw responses on each one of them by Khalid. Then he's switching up to South Park, yeah, just creating more problems for him. Anthony Adams has kept him off balance. He's avoided a lot of these power shots, but I'm not sure what he is doing offensively. Well, and that's what you're shot like that. Right now, you're taking the last three shots of that landed by Khalid. Good leg kick. Yeah, nice kick coming up. Give me a big deep breath. That doesn't mean you stop attacking. Yes, sir. This is your fight to win right now. Yep. That's right. That's right. You keep the attack. You can just tire him out out there. He's fucking tired, and you're fresh. You were down at sea level. You were covering quick. You could pour it on him for five minutes. Hey, I need you to keep finishing on that low kick outside. It's... What does he need? Tower. Uh, tower. You wait three. Where's the towel that was here? Heard the reference to sea level. Obviously, Anthony Adams training at elevation, which is called that because it's a mile high in Colorado. Yeah, but Khalid is training yeah. in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thank you. That's some elevation, also. And we're even there is an elevation. They'll find stairs. Yeah, there you go. But 
you ever been to those places, if you've been to Denver, you've been to Colorado, that's no joke. <laughs> that is no three. joke. You start Round running three. out there. Fight! You quickly feel it. Yeah. Again, right here, the big difference you're seeing Cleet trying to land that one big shot. He's not throwing in combination, so if that one shot misses, then he's actually accepting a counter from Anthony Adams. So more into combinations where I think would work well for Khalid. Let me pose this this way. Do you think there is a avenue for a judge to have seen either of these rounds for Adams? Oh, absolutely. You can take a look at when you're looking at volume, because it, which guy's been hurt, which guy's been hit by heavy damaging shots? Well, neither one really, but so volume is what's taking place. It's a nice clinch right here. Likely he's got the ability to possibly get this takedown. We'll see if he's able to make this happen. Nice job by Anthony Adams. Keeping the fight where he wants it. I would say, you know, landed as far as when I was talking about volume of strikes. Looking at, the, you know, the first and second round, I would actually, I believe that Anthony Adams has landed more shots. Now, he may not have landed with as much power of each one as Khalid, and so that's going to be for the judge to try to decipher what he believes was the most effective. Was it the volume or was it the power? Now you go. 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 Awesome damage. Yeah, it has. And it's been clear that Brazil, he doesn't try to catch that kick for a takedown. I think he's thinking more of keeping this fight in the stand at the times. Again, that's where numbers can be. That's a good one. Numbers can be misleading, but again, it's volume versus power, both with the kicks and the strikes. Yeah, but you take a look at that 24 or 48. We're talking about, you know, not just doubling or the tripling as far as what is landing. One of the better shots in the fight. Wells had him a little off balance. And he comes back. Nice left hook. I'm seeing a little bit more urgency on the part of Mursalayev to come in and engage and try to land that big shot. This time he does grab the leg. Blow in the middle of it. Yes. Yes. Chris <laughs> Lyab tells we doing? referee Blake Grice, no. And he goes, yes. Accident. <laughs> and the, the guy who delivers the kick doesn't really get to the side there. No, he doesn't. You take a look at what happens You've here. He gets the body up lock. Five minutes. And he brings the knee up. <laughs> Looks like it touches below the belt line, maybe at the oh, top doing? of the cut. So no, it's, it's, a, it's, no a, coaching on a, foul. it's a good Sorry. call as far as he's got to keep those knees up above, down below, and make sure that there's no doubt Ready? where it's sure? landed. All right. Hey, come right in here for me. You just heard Blake Rice. Here we go, guys. Mark out. We don't Turn hear this a lot. Fight. No coaching on the foul. That's because when, it's, when the time is called, that's not the coach's or the corner's time. That is the referee's time. You don't get to coach your, your fighter at that moment. Could you just tell some fan what to yell at? <laughs> 
this is, we go to the cards here. This is going to be interesting. Yes, it is. Because you can see the urgency on Khalid Merkulayev. He's trying to press this. He's trying to come more at him. This could be 40 seconds early to say it. This is the heck of this could be one of those fights where it could be 30 to 27 for either guy, depending on how you look at it. And he's looking for a switch here. He's put a lot of pressure down. Trying to get his leg to the outside. Of like getting the switch, he's going to be putting pressure down on that shoulder area of Mr. With the amount of time, this takedown is not going to really take effect. He's going to have no impact in this round. High stakes fight for Murtis Aliyev in his second fight in Bellator, trying to climb into the top 10 at 185, and he's going to have to sweat it out here going to the cards. Yep. I need to fix your cut again. Here. You leaning one way or the other? I'm actually leaning towards Anthony Adams. It, and to me, that's an easier case. This is one of those ones where if you were judging the whole fight yep. versus the individual rounds, this is just really could go many different ways. It'll be interesting to see the way the judges go on this, but it was a good fight for both guys. I just think that the volume of Anthony Adams yep. overdid what Khalid Mertzalev was able to bring. He landed some good shots, but not enough. Woo! Yeah, stats will bear that out. Volume for Anthony Adams. The power shots for Mertzalev. Were there enough? Most of those kicks for Anthony Adams, those little front kicks, taking Murtis Aliyev off balance. <laughs> Philadelphia born, Sugarfoot Anthony Adams. Doing his work, he said in Colorado, Name we might not have expected to try to get on the list here. He said at the top, underdog, yeah, but certainly a live underdog. There was no question about that. No doubt about it. His size and that reach really caused problems the entire fight. And Micah Lee Williams has the answer. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go to your scorecards where all three judges, Sean Dallas Hall, Frank Trigg, Wade Vera, all see it exactly the same, 29 to 28. All have it for the winner by unanimous decision, Anthony Sugarfoot. An upset, but an earned one for Anthony Adams. Shaking up the puzzle again at 185 well, to Jim Brown. Well, six down and one more to go here on our undercards here in the Shark Tank. Now, make sure you guys stick around because at the top of the hour, we're going to move over to Showtime for a stacked card. But let's talk about our last fight we got coming up here on the prelims. We've got Grant Neal. He's taking on Alex Blizzy. Now, Josh, uh, I know you said you thought this fight should have been on the main card, right? You said this one's going to be a good one. Why should fans be excited about it's this It's a one? great fight, but look, there's just not enough room on the main yeah. card for everybody. So, but Grant Neal right now is one of the most explosive and undefeated fighters right now that we have and you can tell when he gets to the double leg he gets the takedown he gets to the top position everything he does is explosive he's got heavy hips you can tell he's extremely strong but look he has been through a process of learning what he's doing in that cage he's been doing it in the Bellator cage since the beginning so his process of learning has been all of the action has been done in that cage so he's learning as he's go and learning as he goes but he has been dominant he's had some great wins he's physically strong and he's explosive but I'm excited to see him fight. Absolutely. Speaking of dominant, his opponent tonight, uh, Polizzi, he's he's eight and one, right? He's got seven of his uh, eight fights. Those have all been finishes. This is going to be a good one. Yeah, the two of them mix up very well. I think what you're going to find out with both of them, though, is that the wrestling's going to offset each other. Polizzi's going to try to get takedowns. Grant Neal is going to sprawl and brawl, stuff the takedowns. 
and Polizzi's gonna come out there and just continue to be aggressive. Takedown after takedown after takedown, and when he gets to that top position, he's just as dominant with the ground and pound as Grant Neal is. But what you see with Polizzi is the takedown ability. He changes everything from not just lifts and slams and suplexes, all the stuff that's high flying, but he's really aggressive with his submission attacks as well. So he will work for submissions, whereas Grant Neal will be looking to try to escape and get back to his feet. You think these guys match up pretty well, then? They match up really well. I mean, you have 6-0 in Grand Neal, and you've got 8-1 in Polizia. I'm, I'm excited. Now, look, like I said, I would have liked to have seen this fight on the main card, but look, they're main eventing the prelims. I mean, come on, this is good, too, though. Great way to go out. Well, uh, many have said this one will be a barn burner, as Josh just did, so why wait any longer? Sean, let's go back down to you. No, guys, you're exactly right. Eyebrows were raised to all of us that this one was not included. Now, next month in Phoenix, semis of the light heavyweight Grand Prix. Got Christian Edwards coming up top of the hour. Phil Davis, Joel Romero in the main event. Top 10 at 205. Going to look a lot different a month from now. And both of these guys want a place in line. And for tonight's final matchup on the prelims, we welcome our first fighter, Alex E.C. Polizzi. Collegiate wrestler at Northwestern, the light heavyweight champion and legacy on his way to the big leagues where he debuted with not just a win, but a convincing win over a former world champion, Rafael Carvalho, a very high-credentialed young fighter. And something you'd like to see sometimes is a strong bounce back from that inevitable first loss for a young fighter. And that shows you something we certainly saw from Alex Belize. Absolutely. Alex Belize is he's a dynamite wrestler. He's very strong in his ground and pound. He understands his body position. His last fight against Anglicus that he lost, that was one that he wasn't able to overcome the size of Anglicus and the boxing. And he just took too many shots, wasn't able to institute his rest. He's got a smaller fighter in Grand Neal, but someone that comes about to fight the same way as Julius. So we'll see if he's learned anything from that one defeat. And now, Grant, the true Neal. They say to err is human, to forgive divine. So what is finding forgiveness when you didn't err in the first place? Grant Neal won a Division II Football National Championship. As a freshman, his athletic career was on a big-time trajectory when it was taken from him in an instant. False accusations from the university that he attended, not only not corroborated, but strongly denied by the alleged victim, resulted in a suspension. Colorado State, Pueblo, Grant Neal was proven innocent. The school was forced to settle in embarrassing fashion. John is so easy to be bitter. Instead, he is back in school, pre-med to become an orthopedic surgeon, and asked for that anger that we would all have. He's found a very efficient way to reach him. Well, you just said that perfectly, because I will tell you right now, Grant Neal is one of the greatest people sure you will ever yeah, meet. Sure you night. talk about Remember, positivity. You talk about always being up. Always Grant Neal is that guy. He's amazing, and he's an amazing fighter, and this should be an amazing fight between these two. Check out the tail of the tape. Grant Neal ranks seventh right now among the light heavyweights. Alex Belize knows he will join that top ten with a win here. Very simply put, look at that. Grant Neal at 6-0, undefeated. Belize with the one loss. This should be absolute barber. A lot of bright lights shining on 205 in Bellator. It starts right here and right now with Michael C. Williams. Tonight here at SAP Center, the time has come to conclude the prelims here at Bellator 266. We'll do it with three five-minute rounds in the light heavyweight division. Introducing the blue corner at six foot weighing in 204.9 pounds. His professional record, eight wins, just one loss, fighting out of Madison, Wisconsin, Alex E.Z. Belize. And across the cage, his adversary out of the red corner at 5'11", right, weighing in at 204.1. The undefeated professional enters at 6 and 0. Oh, he fights out of Denver, Colorado, Grand Patrick In charge, your brother Ray Mike Felton on.
reference, Polisi's loss, Julius Angliscus, who is, of all the names we talked about at 205, that's probably the one name of the most dominant fighter that is not getting any attention at the moment. And that is a 205 who came into the cage against Polisi, and all of a sudden, they looked like they were from different planets, let alone different weight classes. I mean, it, he looked like he was 220, 225. Oh, Angliscus is, he's huge. Yeah, he, just put together like a Greek god also. He's just super strong, very good with his boxing, very just basic and sharp. Doesn't throw a lot of looping punches, a lot of straight punches, but very effective. As you said, stay tuned. Oh, yeah, he's shot like Randy on a quick left jab. Knocked the Lindsay backwards. Get to showtime at the top of the hour. There's a major announcement coming. Regarding light heavyweight Grand Prix next month in Phoenix. A lot of you already creeping around online with piece some of it together. Stay tuned, we'll make it official Good on Showtime. Belize has already learned quickly that Grant Neal is a strong, strong man. Not easy to take down, but he's gonna, he needs to be very careful at not getting frustrated by getting, getting shut down in those takedowns. But he's gotta watch the striking power of Grant Neal. And then we talked about the Division II National Championship as a freshman started in that game. Level change. And this is the difference when we talk about MMA. Khaleesi is a guy who comes from a, a collegiate wrestling background, but you see Grant Neal, who's just athletic, becomes an MMA fighter. He gets the takedown, and that's based upon you're going to get yourself out of position by throwing strikes at times, and the takedowns will come. Some early shots taken by Polisi, and in the Angliscus fight, he was asked after the fight what he did well in that loss. He said, well, beating jabs is a skill. I did that well. Right now, that left hand of Grant Neal, be it by jab or hook, it is landing and landing consistently. Polisi coming out of line hard. And that's what... So strong. Talked about the football background of Grant Neal playing at a high level of Division II. He also won a Little League football national championship, which helped the fact that he played with his best friend on that team, Christian McCaffrey. That guy plays football. So if Grant Neal tells you to take Christian McCaffrey first in your fantasy football draft. It's not just because he wants to help your team. He's been his best friend for years and years. And if he wants it in season right now, he'd be at the SAP Center, there's no doubt. Christian McCaffrey is just unbelievable running back for the Carolina Panthers. And a huge MMA fan. Oh, yeah. yeah left hand, five minutes mark. Another level change and another takedown. Boy, this has to be a frustrating first round for Polizzi. Yeah, Polizzi had to come into this looking. He goes, oh, you know, when it comes to the wrestling, that's going to be my area. And so far, he's been the guy that's been taken down multiple times. Now, let's be honest, Grant hasn't done a lot with the takedowns. But in the stand-up, he's landed the better strikes, and he has gotten the best of the grappling by the takedown. So right now, Polizzi's got to figure out something to counteract what's occurring. And Neil talks about the first three rounds he ever sparred when he got to elevation. All they did was throw him in with Pat Barry, Brandon Gertz, and Justin Gaethje. That means someone doesn't like you. <laughs> anyway, that's that sounds like a prank. Well, that's Jake Robles, who is his coach. Jake does not get near the credit that he deserves for being an outstanding MMA coach. He you know, takes care of his guys, he works them well, but he's going to challenge you in the gym. He's going to make you better, and that's why Grant Neal is here now. Puts together a very impressive first round. Calm down. Get a big breath. Get a big breath. Get them words in, Pete. 
Get them more gentle. Listen up. Breathe. You see, breathe. don't leave your head down by his hip. Bring your head up to the center. You're timing the takedown perfectly, but he's not wrestling with you. He's just jumping the gear. Yeah. So keep your head in the center. Posture up, and you can turn it. Okay, don't keep your head down here. Be smart yeah. the head position. Give me another picture. This is where please he, he overextends, comes in. too fast. You see just the level change and its strength that Grant Neal uses to pick him up, drop him down. Now, the one thing that you're gonna see out of Grant Neal that he needs to change is when he does get these takedowns, notice his head being on the outside go, 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 and he's go, driving go. towards his head. He needs to bring his head to the high side and in my opinion, get his head up, more up, towards up, the center of Polizzi so that guillotine attempt is not even a concern. Three takedowns in round one, all for Grant Neal. All right, gentlemen, second round. You ready to fight? You ready to fight? Let's go. Let's go, team. Let's go. Nice one, two by Grant Neal. Started off. Okay. Started round one. The jab has been impressive. Belize starting to just show a little bit of frustration. Yeah. He's overextending here. He's getting hit. And he's starting to get a little wild. He just needs to keep his composure. He's got good skills, he's got good wrestling. Just take your time, find out your position like he is right now. See it in his body language after round one. He wasn't hurt, but he was very frustrated. Nice job of dragging that leg out. He's going towards that ankle. Trying to treetop that leg. into this. Yeah. He's doing a good job with his head position, driving Grant Neal's chin over to the side for the most part. At least he's one of the guys I was talking about earlier that says, yeah, I, I don't watch film, I don't watch tape of my opponent. Grant Neal looks like he's got the playbook so far in this fight. Grant Neal, is, he's, he's done very well in understanding where Polizzi is strong and what he needs to do to counter his game. But right now, he needs to frame out, walk his way out of this, and get his back off of the cage, which he just did. The high level prospects at 205. Christian Edwards will kick off the main card on Showtime, top of the hour. I'd really like to see Grant Neal utilize that jab in a more continuous fashion. He's been effective with it. That was a big plucking action with it, but that jab has worked for him. He can use that jab with the cross off of it. He's been able to touch Alex Polizzi. Right now you want to see Grant put a lot of weight down to, on the head, keep the head of Pleasy down towards that canvas. He's unable to do so, that's why Pleasy able to pull that leg out. Nice job of finishing that takedown by Pleasy. Neil working his way, using the cage as a great balance point. Attempt is not going to work with the leg position that you're seeing from Grant Neal. In fact, he's getting himself caught in a Von Blue choke. There's a possibility of him being choked out here. Watch the left shoulder of Polizzi. He's able to drive it forward. He needs to get his hands together. He doesn't have that, so he's not able to put enough pressure. But Grant needs to let go of that head. From this position, right now, Grant Neal's left arm is trapped. He is. cannot get, get it free, and there's a lot of pressure. Polizzi is working for a Von Flu choke here. Nice job of Grant to get his arm free. So easy to wind up in danger. Sometimes it's hard to describe what inexperience does and where it shows up. That's a great example. The fight's turning. Yeah, it's turned dramatically here. 
nice movement by Polizzi. Trying to get a hook in. Did not settle. Got himself back onto the hips. Well, he got one hook in right now with the left hook. He's trying to put himself forward. Nice job Ooh. of getting that hook. He's got him both in now. <laughs> Flattening out the hips. Brand Neal went from controlling this fight to just trying to survive the round. Right now, please be looking for that rear naked choke. Brand Neal won't let him lock hands. <laughs> that happened fast. This thing turned instantly. And a big second round for Alex Polizzi. How did that change so fast? It changed fast based Give upon that breath, takedown about me. Alex Polizzi okay. saying, you know That's what, I need to go back to where I am good, go one back one. to sticking to my one game one. plan, okay. I'm going to work at the takedown, he gets it, got position. That was a good round for you, yeah, okay? You won that I round. think we have an even fight, fight. first round for Grant Neal, yeah. second round going to Polizzi. We trained for this our whole life. We trained for this our whole life. Both guys need this third round. That's right. Think about what 205 looks like right now, and think about what it's going to look like like four weeks from tonight, after Polizzi and Grant Neal, after Christian Edwards fights tonight, after Phil Davis, Joel Romero, after the light heavyweight Grand Prix semifinals. Go get it. It is moving day and moving month at 2.05. See the result of that left jab of Grant Neal early in the around. fight. Polizzi's body go. language has completely changed. He's gone from frustrated to ring the bell. Yep, got a little bit more. Just wants to get out there. He wants to get back to what he was doing. We'll see if he's able to do it. Well, that was a strange front kick. It looked, was. almost looked like Alex hurt his knee on it, but stick it in there. You saw that shot coming. Nice job by Grant Neal. Brings himself right back to the center of the cage. Ball moves straight back. Lateral movement is what he needs right now. Please, he pushes into the cage. Turn off. Turn off, Right now, Grant Neal should establish an underhook and turn that position. Don't accept this. Lisi has gone over and over again. He's gone down very deep to try to get that. Well, right now he's angle. into an Iranian lift. Yep. All that work, getting no results. That does not make you feel good at Ralph Lizzie. You see, he look is at, exhausted. Look at the big breath. Right now, Grant Neal needs to come around. Don't accept the position. Hey, there was an opportunity there for Grant Neal. He's tired too. There's something to me, John, about the way Polizzi is moving on his left leg, even though the rush earlier was off balance. Do you remember that kick that he threw? Yes. Weird position is yes. getting it up there. Brett, finish it! Brett, finish it now! Yeah, Polizzi's not right. Keep coming! Keep coming! Yeah, he's, he's, that right leg is stepping very stiffly with the back right there. This is a problem. A little bit of a twist. Ah, but he threw a nice kick with it. This one has lived up to our height. Nice change of levels. 
but not enough to drive into Grant. He's going to have a hard time finishing this takedown, but at least he's able to get him up towards the cage. Both guys are exhausted. In those arms, they're both heavy, their legs are heavy. But if you're Grant Neal and you see Alex Polizzi doing what he's doing right now and his hands down low, that's got to tell you, I got to go, I got to make him break. Not saying you can do it, but at least give that effort and try. Stakes to 205. They have both fought like it. Red Neal dominated, controlled the first round, but Alex Belize turned it around dramatically early in the second round. Had a couple of opportunities to end it on the ground. This was very much up for grabs here as we're about to enter minute 15. See the hand position right now. Belize foot on his butt by Neil. We'll see if Neil can continue and hold this takedown, make it effective. He's lacing the legs of Polizzi, but his head is down, and that is not a good place. He needs to get his head up high. Hard. Grant Neal still working, trying to hold that leg. Both guys are just yes, they are exhausted. Yes. They've given everything they could. And then almost a pile driver, power slam. Powerball. Yeah. Wow, what a show. What a show. So you want it to be a judge. Young man, you're gonna hear about that's a fucking one at 205. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, it was. That was a war. He came in here ready for it. He came in here ready for it. We talked in the last fight in the Anthony Adams upset win over Ali versus Liam about output. Statistically, if you're into this thing, Polizzi had to do more output. Grand Neal for six or seven minutes seemed to be really in control of this and really had Polizzi frustrated. But again, you got to look at, and it is, you can look at the output and then you can look at the power. Did the power have an effect in the yep. fight? So it's going to be interesting to see which way the judges go. 31 strikes landing compared to 37, very close. Punches, a little bit more for Polizzi. Takedowns, which is amazing. Four for Grand Neal yep. compared to two. For Alex Polizzi, the wrestler, just very, very close fight. This will be interesting to hear after the fight of what, what this young man was going through physically. Well, I got to say, his product placement game is on point. Oh, on point. He may have the meets. Does he have the decision? These guys are going to sleep well tonight. Uh, well, and, you know, neither guy at this moment is sure. Nope. They, they shouldn't they be. Want the fight? No, they should not be. You know, you're in the right sport when you go through that and said, "Yeah, it was a blast." <laughs> We are awaiting the answer. Only one man has it, Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your three judges. Your first, Jaron Vallel, scores the fight 29-28. He scores it for Neil. 
Your second judge, Sean Dallas Hall, scores the fight 29 to 28. He sees it for Polizzi. Your third and final judge at cage side, Wade Vera, scores the fight 29 to 28 for the winner by split decision, Alex Easy. He took his best shots, he took the takedowns, and now he has taken the zero from Brant Neal. And I'll be the first to say it, John. I think someday, somewhere in the Bellator cage down the road, we're gonna see this again. I think you will see these two guys in the cage together again. But, you know, that fight could have gone to either guy. Absolutely. You cannot be upset. Either way, it was heart and a lot of skill in that cage. What a way to start this extraordinary month in the 205 division at Bellator. It continues with another undefeated prospect. Christian Edwards coming up next. He will open up the show while Georgie Karahanian and Saul Rogers steal the show. Two former title challengers and Damon Gracie and Alejandra Lara trying to get back in place. But the main event, the Bellator debut of Yoel Romero against Phil Davis. Get to showtime. Top of the hour. A Bellator battle when top contender Phil Davis takes on Yoel Romero in his highly anticipated Bellator debut. Live tonight at 10 on Showtime, the home of combat sports. Yoel Romero, the soldier of God, a wrecking machine. He's an Olympic silver medalist wrestler built like a superhero made of steel. For years, his name has struck fear in the middleweight division, battling anyone in his way, and now he's looking to capture his first belt by moving to light heavyweight. To complete this mission, he'll have to go through one of the most competitive divisions in the sport of MMA, the Bellator light heavyweight division. Who will he have to beat? Will this finally be his path to glory? Number five, Bill Davis. The first entry on the list is his first Bellator opponent, Mr. Wonderful Phil Davis. Davis is one of the most calculated fighters in the business. Notice how Davis is never in any other fighter's highlight reels. He is smart and knows how to win without taking damage. No doubt he will avoid Romero's power and look to take this fight to the ground. That being said, it's not uncommon for two great wrestlers to meet and keep the entire fight in the standing position. Davis will come in with close to a five inch reach advantage. Will he try to keep this fight at range? Romero is explosive and one wrong move from Davis could see him being part of Yoel Romero's highlight reel. Number four, Gegard Mousasi. Gegard Mousasi continues to bully middleweights and welterweights who challenge for his belt, but how will he deal with the much bulkier and stronger Romero? Mousasi is known for his snapping jab. That lethal jab does a great job in setting up his attacks, from kicks to clinch work to overall cage control. He also has a three inch reach advantage over Romero. Could that jab prove to be the real difference? Question is, where does this fight even take place? Romero has contested much of his career at 185 pounds. Musasi has expressed an interest in moving up for big money fights to challenge for the belt. 
A fight with Romero checks both of those boxes, and the fighters will just have to agree which division this fight will take place in. Number three, Ryan Bader. Finally, we have a fight where Romero has the reach advantage, only by a half an inch, but in MMA, that half an inch could be all that matters. No doubt this one is about who dominates the ground and pound exchanges. This is a fight where you will hear the punches and elbows landing in the arena and at home. And while both can throw bombs, I suspect this one will be about the fighter who controls the clinch work and gets the better takedown. Romero has the better athletic footwork in this one and the ability to cover a lot of ground with his strikes. Bader doesn't fight well when he's moving backwards. Can Romero make him move in that position? It will come down to who gets in first and wins the early exchange. A win over Bader will prove that Romero has what it takes to be a Bellator champion. Number two, Vadim Nemkov. The reigning light heavyweight champion, Vadim Nemkov, is possibly the most complete fighter on this list. His raw power and ability to dictate the fight could make him Romero's toughest challenge. Age could be a factor when it comes to this matchup. Nemkov is only 29 and getting stronger and better by the day. The Russian also trains with the current interim heavyweight champion, Valentin Moldovsky, so he will be prepared for a well-built Romero. Nemkov has close to a three inch reach advantage and he loves to set up the head kicks off of his striking. Romero will need to find a way to stay out of the danger zone while planning to get inside position on Nemkov and make his life difficult. Nemkov has built his entire game around Sambo and that should make it an even playing field when it comes to the grappling arts. Romero may not be able to push him around in this battle. Number one, Rumble Johnson. Fans have been excited for this fight since it was announced in the light heavyweight Grand Prix quarterfinals. That didn't happen, but this could be the biggest fight in Bellator history when these two finally square up. Rumble and Romero both have huge star power and even bigger knockout power. It is a true clash of the Titans. Rumble is one of the most athletic opponents Romero will face. Not only can he move, but he can end the fight while moving backward. If Romero chooses to try and pressure him, it could spell the end. And if Romero's head movement or level changes are not on point, Rumble could land one of those deadly right hands. And that is usually all it takes. But while Rumble has only had one fight in the last four years, Romero has taken on a top caliber of challengers in the division for the last four years. Will this experience give him any kind of advantage? This one will not be going to the judges. You can expect it to end violently and suddenly, and it will definitely go down in history. The new Bellator MMA app is here. New look, new features, new fights. Watch live weigh-ins and prelims. Share your fight picks. Earn points and badges as you rank up to the heavyweight division and stay up to date on events, rankings, and news. For all of the latest features, download the new Bellator MMA app. Available on the Apple Store and Google Play. With Yoel Romero making his highly anticipated arrival at Bellator 66, it's time to look back at some of the other amazing fighter debuts in the organization. This is the top debuts in Bellator MMA. That's one of the most dangerous punches that left hook right over the top of the guard. Big swing, big now, knee to the body. Counter knee from Joey Bell. Against the fence, working the body, and then bang, left hook right on the chin, right, right on top of that, right hook to the head. And Beltran went down. Let's take another look at it. Left hook right in, yeah, he just flops down. Well, over to Shara being talked about for a world title shot in the UFC, he was dominated by Phil Davis. Yeah. Crushing top control, long arms, which makes it easy to hunt for submissions like this. Man, he's going hard for that Kimura. 
Emmanuel Newton trying to get the legs free so he can sweep out of it. He's in huge trouble, and it's over. Commitment to the Kimura, and look at him lock down the legs of Emmanuel Newton. Traps them with his legs so that Emmanuel Newton can't roll out of it. It keeps his hips right in the right position. And fist. he held out as long as he could. That fist all the way up behind the neck. A little more, and the shoulder pops. Imagine the roller coaster of emotions for Phil Davis, where his Bellator debut was as dominant, as impressive as it was. If things don't go his way here. Combo, beautiful left hand right on the chin. Carmaz hand up trying to defend himself, but he is out. Right hand came down. It's glued to the head on the ground. That was that delay we saw with Jason Herzog. Looks like he's intelligently defending. The hand drops. That's when Jason jumps in. Good stoppage. Phil Davis all over Carmaz. Look at that leaping left hand. A little homage to the guys like Roy Jones Jr. That leaping left right on the chin. Forget being a grappler tonight. Phil Davis, a complete mixed martial artist. Beautiful shot. Michael, you ready? Ryan, you ready? Come on, boys, let's go. The bell in round number one. There's our fight clock. It's brought to you by Miller Lite, the official beer of Bellator. It's not just a good time, it's Miller time. Oh, good right hand. He's in big trouble. And that is it. A one-punch knockout win for Michael Page in his U.S. and Bellator debut. Before even began this fight is over this crowd is stunned into silence man since he liked it so much the first time look at that right hand doesn't even 